Ah, we're back. Hey. Oh, that was a very short hour and 15 minutes or exactly whatever it was. But um, looks like the crowd is already filing in. Johnny, Leg Kick, Rodney, Sequential Artist, Lewis Bright, or even Jeff Potts. He, uh, he wants a reward for being first in the chat. And I've got this for you. This is a reward for you for being first in the chat. So welcome back, everybody. Um, in case you're just surfing around the internet and saying, well, what, what the heck is this? This is Aaron. 2021 and um, it's a spectacular multimedia internet event and that is just one big fat lie but it is an internet event well it's actually on the internet uh, defining whether or not it's an event is well that's something in, uh, entirely different hey Stephen Liebman good evening sir Stephen thank you for dropping in and saying hi I greatly appreciate it Look at this, Aaron Louvier just ate gumbo ready for day two, part two. Fabulous, I wish I had just eaten gumbo. I had some uh, antipasta salad, uh, which is weird, they call it antipasta because it actually has pasta in it. So I don't really, I don't really understand what that is. But anyway, uh, let's see. Joel Hecht is dropping in, let's see that Z. Oh, you'll see it. Louis Bryant Ravens eating better than any of us. Just finished barbecue steak. How about that? Well, it's not even dinner time here yet. I'm going to go right through dinner time. So I'll be like starving and emaciated. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't join us this morning, um, you missed uh, Walter and Louise Simonson, a couple of uh, old friends of Shelley and mine, and just happened to be legends in the industry. And uh, icons especially of the 80s comic um uh comic era i guess decade whatever um and so it was just great fun talking to them and it's you know, we talked for an hour and a half and you know i felt like i was dragging them along um longer than me I, no they did they were very gracious they didn't say get me out of here they were very good but i didn't want to keep them too long i'd still be talking to them right now if they'd uh, you know, but I think at some point you don't want to have your guests on so long that they're asking you to leave, right? So you want to give them the opportunity to get out while it's you know they're still uh, still have a little energy left and they don't turn on you. So, uh, but we talked about a lot of things, but I didn't even get to everything I really wanted to talk about. But um, it was still a great interview, and so all that to say this: if you didn't, if you missed part one, it's probably already posted on YouTube. You can go in and watch it and um, watch the interview, which is, like I said, is about 90 minutes long. And then um, I go in and draw some pictures after that. And what I did was I actually started a Zant Zatanna, or Zatanna, I can't pronounce anything. And uh, I penciled it as kind of a little bit of a teaser to get you guys to come back. And I see that we have about half as many people here right now as there were when I shut down. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna draw Zatanna, and then, and then after that, we're doing uh, uh, Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. Um, I'll be doing the good-looking version, and um, so anyway, those are the two things that are definitely on the menu, and there may be more. Uh, uh, Shelley's uh, she's taking uh, taking a, a little bit of a break. She's been dealing with a headache on and off all day today, so we'll see if she, I'm sure she'll make it back in. <laughs> That's like we used to do actually at cons. That is not an exaggeration of what used to happen at cons. Dude, this is about, a, it gets a little bit longer than this, but it's not gonna get much longer than this. I'm not into that big sort of Moses look. Um, uh, the snacks are here. I have snacks. Let me go over those real quickly. Um, 
I still have, these are going fast though. The, uh, the blue diamond with the dent in the side, the blue diamond honey roasted almonds, fab. I still got quite a few triple berry Newtons. Mmm. And uh, the original beef jerky Jack Links, the uh, um, Sasquatch prefers this brand. Let's have a piece now that I got me thinking about it. Mmm. Because it's like six million degrees up here, it's staying nice and soft. Easy to chew. Jerky that gets too tough, it's not really a good experience for anybody involved, really. All right. Did you start without me? Oh, what was going on? Hey, Johnny Fitz wasn't going to allow it. He said, where's Shelly? Started without me. Mm. Oh, man, I hope she feels better. Well, apparently she feels better enough to get in here. Oh, here thank is. you. Pain pills kicking in. I'm good. Well, Here we go. What's up? First bad joke of the new... Uh, Oh, awesome. Boo! I can't see. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> um. Oh my gosh. I don't drink, so that won't be happening. Um. The girl I took to my high school prom wanted to get hammered and wanted me to get hammered with her, and I wouldn't do it, and it kind of put a damper on the whole evening, if you can catch my drift. Well, okay, maybe that was a bit of an exaggeration on my part, but, you know, look at this. What? Only happened one time, ever. And it started with me screaming, oh, no, he doesn't drink. Mexico, you can imagine. Yeah, I was just sort of buzzed a little bit. I almost fell down the steps to get off the stage. But yep. I was a little, uh, a little dizzy. Hi, Rodney. Oh, now I can kind of see. Johnny. I love it, Shelly, like you're always half your face is on. I know. And so I just hide because you can't take it all in at once. <laughs> Oh, so who'd you go to the prom with? They said your your prom date wanted to get you drunk and take advantage of you. Oh, I just said my prom date wanted me to to get blasted, and I wouldn't do it, so she was pissed at me the whole night. So it, it didn't really go well. What was this in high school? No, this comment, Jeff's. Oh. I think somebody had I suggested that I grow a beard, and I said I don't like the Moses look. Oh. So. Oh, where is Shelly? Oh, you guys, so sweet. Oh, gosh, that's funny. See, I missed some good stuff. You got to be here for right from the beginning. I know. You didn't tell me. I told you I was going to go on. Oh, did you? Sorry, my bad. Awesome. Yep, here we go again. <laughs> we have to help this man. Oh, funny. I'm tweaking Zatanna's face off camera. Tweaking? Tweaking it. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, let's uh, teetotal. Ooh, whiskey. Fireball. That is the best. And beer and wine and... <laughs> and Look at this. Mm. That's so nice. And then for, sh for this is from Shelly. Thanks. We are 106 right now. Yes. Oh, tiger. And um, um, I think it's important to let her remind now that Shelly's here that uh, you're viewing Aaron. 2021. Yep. <gasps> yeah. Christina. Christina. Hey, girl. Oh, is that? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, hey. My kickboxing buddy. Jiminy Cricket gets smashed from a sip of Mike's Hard Lemonade. <laughs> that sounds about like me, man. 
Uh, Spell it, but no, I, I'm a big fan of Fireball. Christina even knows that one. I think I had some at her house. Oops, ruining uh, the family show again. Oh, I, makes the whole yeah. stream better. Yeah, that's. Uh, hey, I can, I can never get anybody about their spelling or their art. It's true. Uh, Mike Miller has joined us to take a shot at Jiminy Cricket. And that's fine with me. So that means he's not taking a shot at me. Yes, he was in front of those ambulance blocking traffic in Florida. Mm, don't really know what that means. It's only 88 in South Carolina. So yeah, I think we're just... Ooh, heat wave. You maybe get... Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Where were you this morning when I inter interviewed the, the Simonsons, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It was epic. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to use that for the rest of my life to make myself look better. Oh, yeah, well, the Simonsons came on my show. But now? Yep. Now you may commence in the drawing stuff. Oh, you have it covered? Yeah, that probably doesn't help. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping that this higher angle maybe will help with the... Uh, oh, shh. Nice glasses. Thank you. I lost my... Uh, Controls. Uh oh, hold on, people. He's out of control. <laughs> so is my vision. I clicked. I clicked too much click, on the wrong click, click. You know, the StreamYard's a good program, but there's way too much clicking involved. And some of this stuff needs to be uh, streamlined a bit. Okay, so we'll come in. Legs. Oh, feet this time. Here we go. See, that's even blurry with my glasses on. It's so weird. But well, I was it's watching. not exactly sharp for being high res. Uh, well, no, I was laying down watching on my iPad, and I get little digital vision strain, whatever. Okay. Yep, hashtag Shelly's shoe con. Fun, fun, fun. Fun Shelly's shoe con. Oh, so Paramount won't let Shatner do con, like for just random people say, we, can I record you saying con? Paramount won't let him. Well, I guess they own the copyright, so. <laughs> right. So they kicks us this little crusty satellite camera showing off our immense fortune. Yep. With our drone. You know, you guys talk about my spelling all the time. Immense is an E, isn't it? I don't know. Like I said, I, I can never judge on spelling. Romance is dead. It's not romance proven. is dead. I think Johnny's been drinking. Well, it's his birthday weekend. Ask, uh, shall I ask Aaron if he thinks romance is dead? If not, prove it. Um... That's Just, a, this isn't that kind of show. <laughs> we're we're just not that like may, that may not be something Johnny, you want to drink. No. That may not be something you want to see anyway. <laughs> we're just not that kind of. You know, yeah, that's not our relationship. Our romance is just giggling. We laugh our butts off every day, so that's the fun part. I always tell my daughter. Looks can fade and all that good stuff, but if you laugh every day, that's what matters. And as many headaches as I deal with every day, he's never once rolled his eyes. Yeah, this is, that's her built-in excuse. Hey, Shelly, now I've got a headache. And but she does. True. Yeah. Like I said, he takes care of me very well. Wait a minute. Now he's he's backtracking now. Not that, Aaron, he says. <laughs> no, but he does. He buys me flowers. He used to buy me flowers a lot. And then <laughs> I said, quit spending your money on flowers because they die. Just buy me jewelry. Yes, that's good. And, uh, yeah. Is it? Okay, well, then I guess I'm the one who can't spell, which I've proven right. more than once. Shatner will be at Ticonderoga, New York at the Star Trek experience in late July for his 90th birthday. For 1500 you can have dinner with him, photos, and an autograph. Guy, can you imagine, wow. what would you talk about? Uh, you remember that episode where 
Can you say gone? No, no, I can't. Fifteen hundred dollars. It's true. I don't care if it's true. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Okay. You already yeah. addressed that. Okay. Yeah. That's when I said, you know, they die and then you got nothing. The jewelry, Amen, jewelry brother. lasts forever. That's what I uh, thought. I didn't think it was I. Look that up. So I, I know there's a controversy. Know. Well, I think it's. It says here it's E M M. Uh, but I think, and then it says I in this one. I think maybe both. Immense greatness and size or degree with an I. So it's showing both spellings to well, be correct. Well, this one is I, but I put it in as E, and it. Let's just. I'll just do some more. How do you spell immense? I. So it's it is. An eye. All right, I was wrong. Again. Well, you know, it's got to happen sometimes. You know, I don't oh, know. Oh, but you know what? I don't know my spelling is so bad. In an urban be... dictionary, uh -oh. there's one with an E, which is even more massive than immense with an I. I Saved always, you. I thought it was, okay, thank you. Yeah, I always felt like it was E. Oh, have oh, you ever drawn any jewelry pieces, original designs? Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, but he's paid for quite a bit of jewelry. I have. Sometimes I just pick it out myself and then say, look what you bought me. And then I, uh, oh, yeah, I see it here on my card. No. Well, sometimes maybe. You've I never made you buy your own jewelry. I bought my own jewelry though. Yeah, but me. that's right. that's you know that was your choice. But exactly. When it's a gift from me, I pay for it. And when it's a gift for you, you pay for it. That's right. You I'm didn't jump on it. that one for the Father's Day gift. You let that one go. Well, I've already kind of beat that uh, horse to death. So right, but I bought. Okay, here we go, folks. I you bought. Did. You do your um, you do air conditioner, but it's not here yet. And by the time it gets here, it'll be cool. The heat wave will be done. It's one of the, why did we spend money on these again? Oh, that's so funny. So, really, Aaron speaks jive, like from movie airplane. Um, yes. Oh, this is perfect. Shelly, tell Aaron a woman with our jewels the beauty in the sky with no stars. Oh, I'm very thing, sparkly. I think Rodney's wife put him up to that. Oh, funny. No, I used to wear a lot more jewelry. I'm kind of scaled back in my old age. Maybe I'm just lazy, too lazy to put it all on. <laughs> I've got all this jewelry, but oh, oh, God, I just, just fatigued uh, from all of it. I uh, can't even do bicep curls to lift up all these bling. Trying to remember. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to remember what I'm doing here. With. <laughs> what am I doing here? How did I get here? Where are the Simonsons? <laughs> <laughs> oh, pull up a Zatanna, will you? I gotta make sure I'm doing this. She just has a, you know, thing. Oh, that. Uh -huh. Every one of them be a wonderful Adam Hughes piece. Yeah, that's fine, right? Yeah, show me Adam's piece. This one? Yeah. <gasps> I picked it out. I knew it's uh, the nose. That's not enough. Um, Try that one down there at the bottom. That dark one in the dark. That's Adam, too. Right? This one? Yeah, okay. So she basically, mm, I guess I didn't make her vest come down far enough. Sort of like boobs are exploding out of her vest on some of these. And I mean, 
there's different there's some that have like a like a bustier kind of or not a what do you call like it another vest what's going on here oh that's a, a top and it looks like a vest well it's like a shirt but see i've already right. done the vest here but they have the yeah. vest coming down here see then it looks like a vest like this i'm sure there's there's clearly variations on right. this. Right. Clearly. So I'm going to do this. And then, yeah, and then there's some with a corset kind of looking thing. Oh, yeah. So this guy's Lots just going to get, options, this guy's going to get some extra detail because I made a mistake and I have to fix it. Well, Lucky them. Yeah, exactly. Well, gosh, you guys could be out having fun, but you're tuned into Aaron. You can't. Aaron. You, gotta, you gotta wait till I'm ready. Aaron. Okay, say it again. Aaron. Oh, you guys could be outside having fun. So we're thankful that you're tuned in for Aaron. There, there we go. Sorry, else. Warned me. Yeah. Thanks, Johnny. So yeah, so I just designed our own little vest. Oh. There, it works nicely. This is nice. In all seriousness, being here is seriously convincing me. In all seriousness, being here is seriously convincing me to give comics a third chance. It's inspiring watching and being part of an awesome show. Thank you, Johnny. So nice. We are here We're to inspire. Fun. We are having a good time. <laughs> Oh. oh, yeah. Our daughter went to the beach today. She said it's hot there even. But if it's There's got to be a million people down there. Oh, yeah. Of course, me being the worry mom, I was like, oh, no. But let's see if I can find out. What beach they went to, but it says it's only in the seventies at Cannon Beach. That's always but like at the beach. It's thirty degrees cooler. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it feels. Well, it's just because of the breeze. I'm sure. Yeah, in the ocean. Oops, sorry, I cut her head off. It's not good. It's like an EC comic. I cut her head off. Can you um, zoom in more? Mm -hmm. I'm working on her face. I don't know how much zoom we've got left in there. None. No. See, I went up higher to get a better, maybe better lighting. So let me see if I can... Um, Mm -hmm. Right to a crotch. Okay. Awesome. That's my werewolf arm. Stop. And there, that's better. Okay, there now you go. that's as far as the zoom is. Yeah. Get. Yeah, I'm not sure that Sammy's ever met Walton Weezy. I don't think she has. Well, when he, if Josh was, let's say, 10. 11 even. Well, it was Florida, so she was around, but she was just a little... She was a toddler. Toddler, chubster. Yeah. Because when we moved back here from Florida, she was... Pre-K. Yeah, so a four. I think she's met him once at San Diego, but... And of course, I'm sure they said, we remember you when you were just a little girl. Mm -hmm. 
she had the the curly baby afro going and so chubby okay Raining in Michigan. Yikes. I'd go for some rain right now, even though then when it's raining, we're complaining that it's raining. Well, I mean, honestly, it's this isn't like the worst thing in the world. If we were downstairs, it's actually quite nice downstairs. Yeah. But I just happened to schedule Aaron Con the weekend of the hottest day in the last, you know, 40 years or whatever. Yeah, it's a record. Look at them gams. That's what I used to say back in the old days. In the old days. Gotta work on the bunion. Oops. We had a bunny. It's the grossest animal we've ever had. Oh, it was disgusting. Dinky. Oh, sure, they're cute. They have to go clean their cage out. Or for Rama. Oh my gosh, I almost threw up. We talked that mover into taking that rabbit when I only moved yep. to Florida. It's like, oh, they're so awesome. You really want this, dude. You can even have the cage. He's like, oh, okay, I'll take it. I'm like, oh, thank God. Oh, too bad we can't take the bunny with us. Yeah. See, Johnny wants to do a demonstration, but Aaron Khan, no, but he's going to hopefully might, well, start no, some of that. I might do, I was going to do, um, um, I'm, I'm going to do that tomorrow, actually. Are you? Yep. Awesome. And I did start to do it yesterday, but you weren't here. You tapped out, Johnny. And so I said, all right, well, I guess I'll save it for later. So very cool. So yeah, we'll have some programming tomorrow. A little education. A little education. All right, so now we'll link her face and get to the uh, using the markers. Ooh, I don't want to use the new markers though. Why not? Because they're new. Sometime. Well, you're gonna have to sometime. Well, I just refilled all the old ones, so I should run them okay. dry and then. Uh, all right. Do what you got to do. David's in the house. Hot games. <laughs> Hot games. Now, David posted that he missed the show earlier today and was very upset. I'm like, Aww. okay. He said, well, at least you can watch it on, um, you know, once it posts, you can watch the thing and review. And then uh, I said, but please, please make sure you don't miss out on your appearance tomorrow night. Um, yeah, that might be frowned upon, but I will commend you, Aaron, on your preparation, and your interviewing skills. Oh. That was really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Well, it's a lot easier when you have people, guests on that actually, you know, like to talk. And so you can just kind of get on a path and let them go. As opposed to having to like squeeze conversation out of them. All righty. So um, David was talking about your gams. 
Oh. <laughs> woo, woo. It's full moon. Um. <laughs> Shelly's finally getting the hand uh, pushing the buttons. Okay, but this this thing, I it, this is one of the funniest things I've seen in a long time. Con, not coin. Right. Autocorrect. I really hat you sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. I know autocorrect. I hate it so much. Yeah, we conned the movers. Well, we did. He was pretty excited. Yeah, to. I'm sure he regretted it about 30 minutes after we left, but. It was his. Yep. Who knows? Maybe he ate it. We got pretty good about giving that thing antibiotics, which is always uh, interesting. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Your three commissions so far have all been female characters. What a shock. Yep. I don't know that I have anything other than uh, female characters on my commission list. I could be wrong, but. Well. Oh, I was thinking of the, of the sketchbooks. You did a Bucky O'Hare and stuff, yeah, but no. not. No, on the. Uh, yeah. On these. Commission commissions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to crack out the old pens. All uh, right. I'm going to move this over here so we don't reach in front of the camera every time I have to get a pen. So we'll start in her gams and work our way up. Because they actually cover the largest amount of area. Watch carefully as Aaron lays down a coat with his warm zero of gray. So warm zero. Aaron does this to dampen the paper so it becomes more agreeable to blending over the top with other grays. So you really layer your colors because it's easier to then add than to subtract away. Yes. So I build slowly from light to dark because it's the coward's way, but it's also the way that affords you the most control. So there you go. So fishnets, easy to do? Um, well, they're easy to really make look bad if you don't do them right, but you just do your best to space the lines and try to follow the curve of the leg a little bit. I was going to say, you have to add some curvature, don't you? Yes. Yes, you do. I've learned a little bit. That's a W2, a warm two. So if it's warm, it has more tone of... Fleshly. More to tan -ish. Yes. And cool has more. Well, cool leans towards blue. These mm -hmm. lean a little bit more towards yellow. <clears throat> Thank you. And then the neutral goes, uh, oh, nowhere, right? Yeah. Neutral has no friends. Oh. Or maybe he has a lot of friends because he's neutral. Doesn't really take sides. Gotcha. And so I'm just basically doing top lighting here. So I've got dark on either side of her thigh and the highlight down the middle. So it makes it kind of, or it makes it feel like it's more rounded like this. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So the light's kind of hitting the part in front. Yep. Not trying to get too cute with it. Just. <laughs> she going to make the hat disappear or the rabbit? She just pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Oh, see how that works. Man. And we'll hit the sucker with the zero again to blend. So I don't really use a blending tool. I use the zero as the blender. 
It's a miracle. See how smooth and Is that room awesome in the zero? Looks? Huh? No, Is no. Is that room in the zero? No. no. Not at all. The blenders are, I was always taught back in my commercial art days, the blenders were for chumps and not to use the blender because they really didn't do anything. Because it's not adding really any color. So, and you can do the same thing with a lighter color over the top of the darker one. You can blend it just as easily and you're actually doing something, creating value or color depending on if you're using grays or colors. Look at that. And it's that simple, folks. Takes a little bit of practice, but I'm gonna dab very lightly on her face because I don't want, I don't think any of this stuff will bleed, any of the um, black marker that I used to uh, ink her face with, I don't think it's gonna bleed, but if I dab it, as opposed to, you know, like I was doing on the legs, rubbing it back and forth, I'm less likely to cause any sort of bleedage because we don't want that on her face, <clears throat> clearly. Clearly. Dark nose. I'm going to drop down to a one because that two is just a little dark right now for me. So when I lay in these other tones, they do tend to lighten up a little bit too. When they first hit the paper, they're wet and so it's darker. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's so dark. And then like, you know, 15 seconds later when it's dried, it's like way lighter. And you're like, oh, that looks just the way I wanted it to look. A few. And get prepared. Once uh, once I'm done with this, we're going to go into sales pitch mode again for a few oh. minutes. And then I'll jump back on the old uh, Art Express and uh, start drawing again. Gotcha. I'm going to go with some C here. Some cool gray number two. Kind of hit those um, eyeshadow a little bit. That'll give it just a little bit of a blue flavor to it. A cool blue. Darken those up just a smidge. Oh, and Shelly crashed and burned off camera. <clears throat> but she's okay. I'm all right. Stay in front of the fan. Fab. Okay, so we're going to do a quick uh, quick little marker job on the uh, bunny because we're just going to assume he's a white rabbit. Now these, interesting enough, these are the new Copic markers. <clears throat> these are the old Copic markers. Now, so which one do you think holds more ink? The old ones or the new ones? Which ones do you think are more expensive? The old ones or the new ones? You guessed it. Um, where did I get this? Oh, yeah, I was going to do the rabbit. And they also made the refill refills smaller too so they hold less ink 
and they say, oh, we redesigned it to make it more streamlined. Yeah, and to carry less ink, so we have to pay more money. But I guess if I had been smart, I would have invented a marker company, and then I could be the one raising the price and laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> of course, that's a quote from Dexter's Laboratory. <laughs> what are you doing back there? Dare I ask? Collecting stuff. Make myself useful. Translate it. I'm cleaning your studio. Me. I can't take it anymore. Me. I'll never be able to find anything again. Maybe. Markers. I know. Just hate to see. That's the problem. It's like it's stupid, but I hate to throw anything away, even if I never use it again. I know. But those those should all just be ditched, unless there's flesh tone, any color ones I would keep. Okay. But if there's any gray ones in those drawers down there in the bottom, and I won't have to look, and then I. I you won't have to feel like I threw stuff away. I'm sure the comments are sure. Shelly can't let the comments go. Well, she I'm has to be on not, you know, we do read them. That's right. We get to and respond to all of them. But yeah, and that's the thing. I didn't really field any questions for Walter and Louise today. Um, because, quite frankly, I had my own questions and I had a direction I wanted the interview to go. You start throwing in stuff from from the audience, and it gets all over the place, and you never get to the stuff that that you feel is important to get to. And so, um, as much as I appreciate and love you guys, that's just the way it was. Yep. But I was I was reading your comments, and I did post some of those comments. That I felt were um, appropriate. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, funny. Do you ever think she should make the rabbit green? You say it's Beast Boy. <laughs> that's, that's uh, Aaron needs good. a laugh track. No laugh. All right, just one. Worthy. <laughs> that was worthy. Yep. She's looking awfully good. Thanks. So now here's an interesting question. I'll interview Shelly. Uh oh. Um, because th this is actually a real thing and uh, with some wives. Now, it doesn't bother you that I draw stuff like this. Uh-uh. Why? Because you do it in a beautiful way. It's not raunchy and it's not. Now, I can, I'll name an, I, when I won't name the artist, but I know an artist who does this type of stuff, mm -hmm. not exclusively, it's not like he's a pinup artist or anything, but his wife was very annoyed with him about drawing, you know, basically these, beautiful women and stuff in his uh, stories or whatever. And he said, hey, this pays the bills. But I just wonder if some, uh, I mean, Shelly Shelley understands that there is like surgically altered for viewing pleasure. Yeah, it's about altered for viewing pleasure. Right. I mean, so it's kind I of would... this sort of idealistic fantasy view of, you know, both male and females. It's not like Superman right. isn't put together, you know? Right. Um, well, like I said about watching that movie Infinite, it wasn't the, you know, the most clever, I mean, it was an interesting movie, but I could watch almost anything with Mark Wahlberg in it. So there you go. You know, I'll watch anything with Denzel in it. Yeah, so, you know, that's that's kind of, you know, I guess. But it, no, but if it's done in a such a way, too, that, it, I don't know, what's the word? Tasteful. Tasteful, you're showing an appreciation. 
for the form. For the form, yeah. Then I think it's beautiful. If you were doing nothing but crotch shots, then I might have issues with it. Because to me, that's raunchy. Yeah. And you'd have to question my motives for doing that. Okay. Well, I'm telling you, this ice pack. Good idea. It's Might working get myself one. well. In light of uh, the lack of adequate AC up here, yeah. this ice pack is doing the trick. Well, I can remember a time when you, I think it was maybe after you got done drawing Wonder Woman, you were just like, oh, I'm sick of just drawing women. Like you wanted to do something very superhero-ish. Not that you were sick of it, but it was just like, I don't know. And I'd be like, draw more chicks. <laughs> where's that the, sells. Where's draw more the, chicks. Where's the cash, man? Got shoes I need to buy. <laughs> okay, shoes are things you can always buy that should fit. Clothing, it's a crap sheet. Uh, well, you, you could have asked it, but I wouldn't have put that out there simply because that gets too political and I want to stay away from that when I'm uh, interviewing people. That's not what this, uh, this show is for and I wouldn't want to go down that, that path because it can get... Uh, <laughs> Hashtag draw <pretty>, more chicks. <laughs> a little bit... Uh, oh. But too, Aaron's very conscious about how he portrays himself and... Um, his values so that like he say if, I, if my mom or daughter can't look at it I'm not drawing it notice he didn't say me but um, yeah and I think that really hits home when you have a daughter yeah I mean she often like why do you always draw girls doing this or whatever and I go why are you wearing that swimming suit <laughs> right <laughs> And, uh, that's the and since that she's been a dancer since she was two and a half, she doesn't think much, you know, anything of, you know, what they wear at dance. And it, yeah, there's not enough white claw in the world to get me to wear that. But I explained to my daughter, I just said, um, cause she did, she kind of asked the question, how can you always draw these, um, I don't know how she put it. Um, she didn't say sexy, but, you know, pretty girls, but I can't remember exactly the terminology she's used. And I said, because boys like girls. <laughs> and that's who's buying my stuff is boys that like girls. So Well, and if I want to see something that we would consider more on the normal spectrum, look at myself. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Oh my goodness. Well, no, I mean, these are idealized characters, right? right? It's just like Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know? It's just in comic book form, so. I don't think that, you know, it puts any sort of pressure on girls to look a certain way, because most of all, let's face it, how many girls are actually reading Zatanna comics? Two? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that, again, that, that's more about I would all, go. you know, Superman, all of those aren't, I don't know. Yeah. They're again, it goes down to what you want to read, what good story, good pictures. You know, I had this conversation characters. with a guy that I thought was interesting about this. And I said, I think part of the problem is with the perception today is the artists are so good. There's so many good artists that the women, I mean, the, the, like Adam Hughes, for example, I mean, you're talking about some really nice work and more realistic looking women. And whereas back even like in the seventies or eighties, you know, John Burns women were, you know, they're kind of cartoony and you didn't really look at them as, anything other than female characters. And John Buscema, as great an artist as he was, he wasn't really 
I don't know, his women were not really saucy. You know what I mean? They were just, they were well drawn and that was it. So you never really looked at them in that regard. But today's artists are so much on the whole are so much better at this stuff. And so these women now, they look more like pinups, less than just, in, in, instead of just comic but book characters. the pinup thing has had a huge revival, hasn't it? Yes, that's true. But yeah, there's probably, so Liz Bright was like, it's probably more than two, while the cosplayers that do dress up as this one. But well, yeah, that's the other thing. Look at this. If you can have, you've got these, you know, hot models dressing up in these costumes in real life, walking around conventions so they can have pictures taken of them and be ogled by a bunch of dudes, then how can you criticize a bunch of dudes for drawing these characters? You know what I mean? I don't know. To each his own. I suppose. But no, I mean, it all goes, I like. When you ask the question, it all goes down to I think how it's portrayed. And you always do it in a respectful I try to. way, I think. Because if you didn't, I would. Yeah. I, yeah, I have no problem voicing my opinion. I don't know if you guys have realized that yet. It's a good point. Matt James. <laughs> Yes. What do you say? Custom of Andy's stream, he was featuring mature, but really immature stuff. He did. <laughs> so I had to unsubscribe. Oh, poor Andy. He doesn't have enough subscribers as it is. Um, but again, to, to each his own, if that's well, you know. I'm not going to cap on Andy or anybody mm -hmm. else. I remember having this conversation with Kevin Nolan because he did some work in that penthouse comics as well. And it's basically, it was a porn comic. But they were paying incredible rates. I know right? you were offered it once. Yeah, well, we never got that far, but we were, it was just had a kind of a light discussion about it with one of the. Well, you guys talked page rates. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, that's true. Because I remember going. Well, your your to, first, you know, thing is, oh my gosh, and then you're like, oh wait, never mind. Yeah, eight hundred dollars yeah. a page. Mm, maybe okay. I'll do it. Uh, no, wait, really I won't. forgot. Yeah, I remember having the conversation with Kevin Nolan, and I didn't mean to insult him or anything, but we were sitting there talking. I was just talking about me in particular. I said, I just. You know, I said the money was great and everything. I said I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And he goes, oh, I didn't have any problem with it. Right. I asked. <laughs> and I was like, you know, you do you, boo. Yeah. What I say. So. Awesome. But yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I, do, I just don't think a lot of people pay attention to the fact that when you're doing these live streams, or even just when you're out in public. There may be people that don't want to listen to you drop f bombs, and there may be people that yeah. don't want, you know, to hear pornographic stories or whatever. And I just try to, you know, I'm not going to come on a live stream here and be dropping f bombs, and I don't do it anyway. But mm -mm. you know, or telling, you know, we've had a few off color jokes here, but it's still, you know, it's PG thirteen type stuff because you never know who's listening, I and mean, it just, right. you know, you don't want. And some guys just they don't care. That's how they, they were raised. That's how they live their lives. And it's kind of like, whatever. But well, I, I just can't. Uh, that's I one of my soapboxes is that I had a student that um, I was gone one day and got written up for a referral for dropping an F-bomb in my classroom. And so when I got back, I go, oh, I heard you were blowing stuff up while I was gone and didn't quite get it. And one kid legit not even kidding says what that's like a bad word <laughs> you're like what yeah we're just so desensitized to things now i think that um yeah that's true i mean there's good and bad on everything but it is what it is Well, and as far as the politics stuff go, it's the same with the language and, and material. It's like, why would you pot potentially limit your fan base by, or your audience, I guess maybe would be a better way of putting that, 
Um, by but that's not what they're tuning in being, for either, right? You're not, yeah. you want to see some art, you want to hear some comic stories, maybe be entertained a little bit. And in our case, very little. Um, right. Very you're not little. here to. Yeah, this isn't a political channel and it's not a adult channel. You know what I mean? It's like, so I try to. Yeah. And honey, you do a good job. Thank you. You're welcome. Big fan. Big fan right I'm a big here. fan. Big yeah. Fan right here. Especially when I have enough money to buy the shoes. Yep. But actually, my shoes, I, I will admit, they were gift cards that I was given. So. There are so many pairs of shoes downstairs by the door. There it's are. it's an afternoon job just to pick all that stuff up in the <laughs> racket. Is. Well, we have to pick up all the shoes before. I have to admit, I this year finally broke down and had hired someone to come in and clean my floors and stuff because it was, hurts my back too much. See, now you're giving the wrong impression that we're like loaded and we're not. Cleaning but one. it was in the long run cheaper than chiropractor appointments. Jeweled shoes. Oh, you're onto something. <laughs> I've got like three <laughs> pair of shoes. I mean, that's it. So Jimmy says, come see Aaron draw on here. Shall I slap him around a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I aim to please. Uh, we do have There's fun, a little though. slap around for you. Yep. Yep. Too funny. Whoo! You mentioned it's warmish. As long as I don't move, I'm I'm okay. <laughs> I worry about people that don't have AC. Well, you know, the funny thing is, this is a prime example of how spoiled we are. I mean, just as a, as a culture, as a people, when I was growing up, we seriously didn't have, we didn't have AC. No. We had like, we would sit with the, um, my mom would close all the curtains first thing in the morning. Yep. So the sunlight wouldn't come in and, and overheat the house. And then in the evening, all the doors and windows got opened up, mm -hmm. and we had fans in the doorway, and we'd just be sitting there laying on the floor being, yeah. you know, trying to cool off. And like in Florida, when we lived there and lost power for a couple of days because oh. of a hurricane. Yeah. Holy crap, oh, cool. it was hot and it was humid. In fact, we, we, just, had, we went over to Andy Smith's house because they had power. That's right, until he showed us his penthouse magazine, and then we left. No, no oh, swam in his pool. and yeah. uh, Oh, my gosh. No, our AC just isn't big enough for the house. So we, See, we look, replace it eventually. Look at this. We get we get something yeah. wonderful like this. Although Aww, I think he's thanks. he's making a joke though because she's magic. But well, still, no, it's it's very it's a but. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it's a pun. Okay, good. and then two. Comments later. Yep, old man. There's an old man's story <laughs> for you. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Uh, well, that's what I was closing all the blinds downstairs and everything, and the drapes, and Sammy asked me, what are you doing? Like, trying to keep the downstairs cooler. But i got to teach him stuff. Pass all that stuff down. That's right. We're going to go after I'm done with the show tonight. We're going to go out and churn butter. So that should be fun. <laughs> well, yeah, we're going to walk to school and heal both ways with yep. no shoes on. Yeah, I really look forward to that. Yeah. What's the normal high temp? For this time of year in Oregon, well, we're usually 80s and 90s. Yeah, 80s and 90s. Maybe. Um, I mean, occasionally, occasionally gets up to 100, but. Usually in August. Yeah. Late July, maybe. We'll get some Indian summers out here where it stays. I don't know, is that PC to say that? But um, we get Indian summers out here where it, oh. this September is really nice. Um, 
but then you start getting into October and it's uh, rain, rain, rain. Normal temp. Ooh, I gotta do that. Almost forgot about her top hat. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, my black is drying up, which means yes, August is the hottest month of the year. I could have told you that. Of course, I had to Google it because that's what I do. Max usually, yeah, we're usually in the 80s. August is usually the killer month. But I will say, having spent some a decent amount of time in Phoenix, because my daughter's going to school there, I have kind of a different take on um, heat. It's not it's as bad. That dry heat. Yeah. It's, some people say, oh, but it's a dry heat. We still laugh at that. But it makes a difference. I'm using a uh, neutral gray on the uh, hat and the coat. And I did so in her uh, number hair. Number four, it looks like. Yeah, three and four combo of. Okay, so now I'm going to go and. Oh, I got to do my uh, mm. my fishnets. Well, this is which the moment you guys have all been waiting for. Oh, the pressure. Can you do it without screwing it up? That's true, 120 in Phoenix is still 120. But I love it when they say, oh, it's so-and-so degrees, but it feels like, but, well, then it should just be what it feels like. Yes. It's my opinion anyway. I'm going with a point three. We'll see how it works out. So I'm going to try and curve along with her fly here. I don't want to make them too close together because then it can get really sort of busy. And we don't want to lose all that wonderful shading I did on her leg. I locked down the heel of my hand there so I can lock in that curve every time I do the stroke. So we don't lose control of it and end up with a wobbly line. Okay. So now we shall do the same thing over here. God, you must know if this is what free handling looks like. like what? <laughs> is this what free handling looks like? <laughs> this is exactly what free handling looks like. Do you ever use circle templates and things like that? Matt James would like to know. Well, of course, but um, not for stuff like this. It's too long and tedious a process, and the reward is not worth it. Because um, let's face it, if you're doing fishnet stockings, they're not perfectly lined right. anyway, so you can have a little give here and there. Um, and it's fine. Maybe, it but you know, like Captain America's shield and things like maybe, that. But yeah, you know, things that are big and round that you really can't fake. That's where I get out the circle templates or something that has to really be, really be right on. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, so. What I want to avoid doing is doing this so I have a big long line, like straight line down like this. So I'm going to do yeah. it like this. 
So here's where you can screw up. But I won't. Definitely don't want it run. Yeah, that line down the middle would run it perpendicular, which would not look right. Correct. And if it does have a line like that, it's in the back anyway. Right. You see, with these big holes in the fishnet, if you will, we can still see the, all the modeling I did on her leg. Ta da! And having that little highlight on there underneath it really does bring out the curve yep. in it. So I wonder if drawing these fishnets like that would constitute a satisfying video. Probably. Raking right up there with the, by cleaning the area rugs. Exactly. Very nice. Okay, so we're gonna beef up the holding lines and then we're gonna, then we're gonna sweat like pigs and then we're going to, although pigs don't sweat. It's, so that's a weird thing, let's see. Sweat like. Sweat like an artist. Yeah, let's say sweat like myself. TMI. Let me check on that screen. When it's quiet, you have to worry about the dog. In this heat, he's probably passed out someplace, know, but really usually he's out. chewing something up is the other possibility. He's laying on that cool leather couch downstairs where it's like probably 20 degrees cooler. This is always dangerous to do this, especially on like long curves that you're gonna you know, mess up the smoothness that you've established. But I like to Beef up, beef up these outlines, and so I'm willing to take the risk. There's really not much to do on these black coats because they're already a black line, so I don't really, there's nothing I can do to sort of beef it up. We'll give the rabbit a little bit of uh, treatment here. There we go. Now I want to do a little bit of touch up on her face too because uh, those lines, especially around her eyes and stuff, need to be punched up. Let's go ahead and give her her red lips. Okay, we'll make her eyes blue because everybody has blue eyes in comics. Then I'm going to take this 0.1 micron here and go in and work on these eyelashes just a little bit, thicken them up.
you can really see a darkening up around those eyes that really pulls them out. These lips, a little bit of work. I'm going to go in and put a few, I like to, I don't know, I don't know why, but I like to go in and put a few wild hairs flowing out of there. Point one is a little too thin. Dang it, I had a point three someplace, and now I can't find it. So typical. So typical of me. Uh, that's point five. I know I got a three around here someplace. Excuse my head, but I got to reach over here and get this. I've got it. I can't have got oh, it's, duh, it's right here. Okay. Well, no. um, so I'll go in and put a few. I do this, I think, mainly because I think it looks more. Makes it look a little bit more sketchy, which I kind of actually like. So, uh, let's see. Actually, I have to do this. Uh, took a drink of water. Sorry about that. Uh, are there any characters that I wouldn't draw or would ever draw again? Um, boy. I don't do Vampirella because I just think she's too trashy. And I don't do Emma Frost in lingerie anymore, although I used to do that because that was a surefire way to make few hundred bucks but again it was just I felt too suggestive for how I wanted to represent myself especially with a young daughter and a mm, my bad darn feet um, <clears throat> there's very few but that's one of them somebody asked me to do uh, Satana the devil's daughter and I turned that one down um, you know for what I think is fairly obvious reasons um, I wouldn't draw Son of Satan either. I just, I won't draw stuff that characters, even, you know, whether, whatever your view is on religion or Christianity, that's fine. But anything that I think glorifies Satan or glorifies this sort of notion of Satan, Satan being a hero or something like that, I sort of kind of balk away from that. So I try to stay away from like the, some guy actually contacted me about doing what I thought were darn near, you know, porn comics. He's like, well, no, they're PG-13. I was looking at him going, dude, come on. And I turned him down. Um, but, yeah, so I, I try to stay away from the overtly devil characters, although I like horror, which is a very weird, strange thing, and I can't explain it, so don't ask me to. But, um, I mean, I don't really like horror. I like monsters. There's a diff yeah. I really think there's a difference. Um, yeah. Monsters are fun because they're – I'm using a white pencil there on her hair to kind of give some highlights in there. Ooh, I like. And so mine um, look like right now. Shelly like cracked cracked open the white cloth. We're trying to truly today. What is that? Same thing. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my personal whatevers. So I'm not going to use David's uh, Presto whiteout gun because I don't think you'd have super hot highlights on like a black jacket. I mean, if it was like silk or something, I suppose, or, you know, shiny satin or whatever, but I'm not going to do it at this time. So, yeah, you have to think about the material, how it would 
crease. Look at those shoes. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Shelly's like, ooh, I need a black pair of it's shoes. It's about to be I'm... a truly good evening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a... the potato con. <laughs> what is this? I invited Loprestes and Simon since to my get fat with the potato con, but no one came. Now I'm eating this red velvet cake all alone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know really what that means, but I still think it's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Hmm. You okay with red Sonia? Um, I shouldn't be, but I am. <laughs> Because she's a barbarian chick, it's kind of like Deja Thoris, you know. I I don't know. I that's kind of the if you read the John Carter novels, they all run around naked in the the books, and we can't obviously draw them that way. And I that there's honestly to me that's silly. These are sword fighting nude. Yeah, that Ooh, that's something I probably would that might not. Be mark. Yeah, that's something I would not engage in. And uh, so actually putting them in some sort of you know attire makes sense. But um, I again, Red Sonia can look really raunchy, or she can look, you know, just like a chick in a metal bikini. It depends on how you do it. It's all being tasteful and respectful. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a certain notion attached to certain characters, and Vampirella, for example, has always been a hypersexualized, trashy character. Always, Red Sonia has been kind of a, just a hot barbarian chick with very little clothes on i guess did that make any difference i don't know but it just it seems different to me well and even i can remember and issues i think in maybe it was sludge but how you dealt with even violence yeah i got in some discussions with steve gerber about betraying violence and um and some other sort of sexual innuendo stuff. And I was like, dude, I'm not drawing that, you know? Oh, come on, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, and cause you can portray, I think it was like somebody was supposed to be, uh, something like getting their throat slashed or something. And you kind of drew it from behind. Cause you can still right. show what's happening without full on. Well, Lord, Lord Pumpkin in the Lord Pumpkin Zero issue rips the heart out of one of the clowns in the circus, mm. and I silhouetted it. That's what I, was, I think, yeah, I remember that one. So I thought that's just too gross, you know? Yeah. How's that fresh ice bag working for you? Nice and cooling. Nice. I appreciate that. Thank you You're very welcome. much. I had to break down and put one around my neck. This is a fantastic piece. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry but it is. <laughs> well, yeah, I gotta put my pin down while I pat myself on the back. I know, with the ice pack <laughs> on my <laughs> back. Somebody's getting their money's worth on this one. See, when I, when I do ones like this, they turn out super well. Then you're kind of like, yeah, I should charge more. But then you do ones that don't turn out as well, and you're like, yeah, probably right where I should be. Take the good with the bad, right? So what about Marvel's Dracula and Lilith? Uh, yeah, I don't care about – well, actually, I would – no, I don't have a problem with that. I would draw that unless it was like the satanic rites of Dracula and he was worshiping right. the devil or something. Well, you love the it. classic monster stuff. Too. Well, I'm not a big vampire fan because mm -hmm. he's not really a monster. He's just mm -hmm. a dude with fangs, you know? And I was like, I like... Unless... Unless he's... Can't Count Chocula. Chocula. And then then now, you're a big fan. Now I'm a huge fan. Yeah. Yes, that's right above his computer. Right. We need to dust him here. Really, that's the truth. Okay, so... Magical Satana with some nice gams in a pose in a pose that I can honestly say I've never drawn before. And maybe that's why I like this so much because it's yeah. kind of fresh and new. Oops, sorry, don't hurt my shoulder. That was not that my I, feet. Don't hurt my shoulder. I'm, I guess he probably means patting myself on the yes. back. Yes, yes. Working on my range of motion. Can't help it. See, if I do something that sucks, I will say it. 
But mm-hmm. if it turns out well, I'm going to say it too. It's just, we call it truth, man. So you got little magic dusty things coming off these characters. Well, and there's so many times where he'll be so far into a drawing or a page and then start over because he doesn't like it. And I'm like, dude, just go with it. Nope, can't. I can't. So Lake Kick has a good question for you. Uh, what do we do before? Oh, my bad. I know we've had a few that... I, we should have done this. Here we go. <laughs> and the question uh, was, Aaron, did you ever see Dave Crockham's Creature from the... Where would I have seen it? That sounds vaguely familiar, but where would I have seen that? Are you talking about the, um, the Manphibian story he did in uh, Legion of Monsters magazine? How about that? Oh, that's pulling some knowledge right there. Right there. <laughs> it's a rain man. Uh, that's good. I think that's what your leg kick is re- referring to. Okay, we're coming up for oxygen here. And because I just because I think I can, you guys can get a better view of this if I do that. It's so pretty. It's so pretty. See, if I could guarantee that I would, everyone I did would turn out this good or better, then I would charge more, but it's a crapshoot, man. So do you want to share it with you on Facebook? Share what? Huh? Um, the Black Lagoon thing. Oh, um, yeah. Well, can you answer my question? Are you talking about the Manphibian story he did in, in uh, Legions of Monsters, Black and White Magazine? He made a joke earlier when you weren't here. Oh. And so <laughs> I'm laughing in here where it counts. Uh, I know you skipped a lot of DC. Are you familiar with the creature of Commandos, classic monsters fighting Nazis? Pretty cool stuff. I think I remember them teaming up with Atari Force, but I have to get back to you on that. Yes, I know who the creature commandos are. Yes, I do. No, not that one. Okay. So it's on Facebook. Okay, I'll check it out. Yep. Bill, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Rock and roll Bill Maxwell's here. Um, lol. Liking it. Okay, so, Shelly, it's time. What time is it? To get warmed up. <laughs> the, uh, Been there, done that. This isn't the end of the show, folks. The show must go on, and it goes on and on and, and on. on. Okay, I need you to pull up some reference for me. Okay. Uh, I got you. Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. Uh, Who? Actually, do Captain Marvel Dodson, because Terry okay. designed that costume, and so I'll just use that as my. Reference point for it. This is true, Matt, at least the first part. Good or bad, the commission at some point, it goes out in the world for everyone to see. That's the thing, right? So I guess it doesn't matter really what I charge, right? If it sucks, people are going to see it, and they're still going to go, wow, that really sucks. But uh, thank you. Thank you for saying that all my commissions are awesome. Um, Yeah. If I can find a good shot of that costume. Oh, that's pretty good right there. All right. Yeah, that one. Um, I can't see your boots though, so I'm gonna have to toggle. No, actually, I think the side view is better. Yeah. Well, this one. Yeah. Well, no, the other one, because it's the colors are no, no, no. That did the color just change a little? Or I'm just dreaming. Okay, know. now go to the next one. Okay, maybe I was I looked away at it from that one, and the sky didn't wasn't blue anymore. And I'm like. But I'm the color. But no, that's a, that's a good one. Okay. Oh, okay. So, thank you, thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Allow me to uh, express my gratitude. Ooh. 
I don't want you to know that everyone here at Aaron. <laughs> appreciate you saying All that two as of well. Us. Yep. <laughs> All two of us here at Aaron. Um, oh, so nice. Short. Wait a minute. I don't. What's this referring to? Guys are so nice. I don't know what that means. I'm not sure. Aaron, if you haven't already, check short, out the short. Short. Oh, oh, you're saying Simon said it. Okay, we go here. Aaron, if you haven't already, check mm. out the Creature Commandos animated team up with Sergeant Rock that Warner Brothers put out last year. It's a great animated short, followed up by Walter Simonson was involved with that short because Walter's involved with everything. Um, what a great storyteller. He is. Well, when you've got stories, you know, the funny thing is, the thing, the thing that I didn't even get to touch upon was he, in his early years, was shared in a, was in an apartment building with Wrightson, uh, Howard Chaikin, um, him, I believe, Al Milgram, were all in the same building. If you can wow. imagine that. Now, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't by accident, but still, right? So you got all these legendary guys and early in their careers. I mean, that must have been just crazy. And then, and then later he formed a studio with Chaikin, Jim Starlin, Milgram, and himself. Oh, and now Frank Miller was in there too. Wow. Um, at a very early age. So come on, man. That's I can't say that. I can say I I was in a studio with Terry Dodson and, and Carl and Rachel Dodson and Carl Kiesel and Ron Randall and Randy Amberlin and Gary Martin and everybody else in Portland. And did I say Ron Randall? Yeah. And Matt Haley yeah. and Tom Simmons uh -huh. and Matthew Clark. Uh -huh. Oh, love and, Matthew. And uh, yeah, Ann Timmons was in there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can say that. But Studiosaurus, man. And we did, you know. Chicks. We did well, chicks. Comic book. <laughs> oh, uh -oh. Comic and suddenly book it becomes did. an adult show oh, once again. Man, I just bring us down. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, so I guess, <laughs> you know, Jeez. but it's like. My story is I remember Terry and me and uh, I guess it was Rachel. We were in, we piled Love up. Rachel. It was either my truck or Terry's truck. We both had small trucks. And I can't remember. But we were racing. We were downtown Portland, right? And we were racing downtown Portland to get to the FedEx drop off before five o'clock. And it was like, and we sort of laughed and looked at each other at the time and said, do you realize that this is the first time that our, in our studio that we, we have we're rushing to make a FedEx drop. And so it was kind of like a mon monumental occurrence. And it happened again later, but um, that was like the moment we kind of froze for a moment and said, oh my gosh, this is history right here. The first oh, time we're yeah. racing to the FedEx uh, drop box. And I had hair. Oh, and fun fact. Yeah. We almost named our daughter Rachel. She was not after Rachel, although we love Rachel. Well, kind of. Well, we really liked her name. And yeah. We, you know, she certainly didn't do anything. Rachel, to, Lauren, and Samantha. Yeah, she didn't, the, didn't really. She didn't do anything to uh, to sour the name, shall we say? Um, it used to be my hangout buddy at San Diego. Mm -hmm. If we ever go to San Diego, yeah. shopping, laying by the pool. Yes, yeah. uh, hybrid potato. I did say Atari Force, but it okay. wasn't really. But you said in a it positive out loud. way. But you said it out loud. That does all that matters. That's true. Right. Now, where did, wait a minute, see, I'm, I'm getting ahead. I know, they I all of a sudden go up. And yep, then Kevin Nolan was involved in designing the characters for the short. How about that? Kevin Nolan's a super nice guy. I have a, um, and that, that top drawer right there where yeah. the, uh, mm -hmm. where the pens are. Yeah. There's that big black, my big black sketchbook. That's it. I have my own sketchbook, and I've done a video on this, but that doesn't mean all you guys have seen it. So let's take a moment. And we always say, what does Shelly do at cons? This is what I do at cons. Do we need a, switch the camera. We need a moment thing. Oh, actually, I don't have a moment for me. I just have them for you. Ah. Like I said, I've shown this before, but... Zoom out there for me. Okay, 
so I, I started this sketchbook, right? And I thought, you know, normally people will get somebody to do open the sketchbook. And I thought, who am I going to get to do a double page spread? And plus, I was cheap. I was well, that's going to cost me a lot if I get somebody good to do it, right? And then I thought, you know what? Well, that was 06. It yeah. Was like when you started that one, we yeah, didn't have six. a lot. No. And so I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to do a really rocking opening, mm -hmm. and then I can force everybody else to match it. Mm -hmm. So I did this man thing, Howard the Duck piece, and it says back here, Aaron and Shelley's sketchbook, right? And so I thought, okay, that's a killer opening. That's the best Heart of the Duck I've ever done. And it's also one of the best man things I've ever done. Um, so anyway, there it is. So then you turn the page. And the first person I had to get in the book, there's no exception, right. had to be Adam Hughes. And I basically gave a scenario uh, to Adam. I said, could you, because I like his humor stuff, but it's Adam. So I had to get a girl in there too, right? So I said, um, could you do like uh, Mr. Mitzel Pitlick, you know, dreaming about Supergirl? I said, you know, I, I know it's a two character thing. I said, but it, Supergirl just has to be, you don't have to be big. It should be like in a puff of cloud, you know, because I really wanted the Mr. Pitlick, but he went to town, obviously. And I'm going to make all you guys cry, but you know how much he charged me for this? Mm. 100 bucks. Ooh, yeah. You couldn't get this for a thousand bucks right now. Wow. Uh, this is before he realized everybody was getting sketches from him and putting them on eBay and making hundreds of dollars right. on them. Um, so anyway, that was wonderful. And so then I was at the con and uh, Alex Nino was sitting by himself. So I ran over and I said, Alex, draw me a goblin or some kind of monster. And, and in uh, all, as only Alex Nino can, came up with the weirdest, most bizarre looking thing you'd ever want to see in your life. And there it is in my sketchbook. Uh, then my good friend, Bill Stout, mm, name dropper, professional name William Stout, of course, does great uh, design work and movies and stuff like that for years, and uh, got him to do a Tars Tarkas, John Carter of Mars piece in the book for me. And I think we traded, although I may have paid him because he's a bit of a mercenary, but I don't fault him for that. He does it with he does, he does it with a smile on his face. So you got to say, hey, yep. the guy's a businessman, you know. And so I don't remember if I traded this for another, I did a piece for him or if I paid him, but whatever it was, you know, I was glad to get it in there. And that was 2006. Then I had Michael Golden do um, Dr. Strange. I really still want to have him go back and ink it and run into him. If I, if I remember to bring my sketchbook at a show that he's out, I'll have him go back and ink that. Uh, now the reason I thought of that was because you brought up Kevin Nolan and I had Kevin Nolan do Jack Pumpkinhead. Um, he did this in, uh, at a Canada show we were at, but I think he charged me like 80 bucks Canadian for me. So it was like $60 or something. It was just ridiculous. And I was like, but I think he was actually thrilled. That I didn't ask him to do Batman or something. He's like, can you do a Jack pumpkin head? He's like, what really? And I'm like, yeah. So, cause I didn't really want this book to be full of superheroes right. as much as I wanted it to be sort of kind of. So yes, Johnny, it is his personal sketchbook. Yeah. This is what I take around and get my friends to, or, um, uh, people that I admire to do work in. Um, so this is Hillary Barta doing a zombie sketch for me, which I think is terrific. Um, what do you say? He said, the, the word balloon says, and I said I wouldn't be caught dead in an Aaron Lopresti sketchbook. Then he has Hillary Barta, 1957 to 2007 up there. And he said, Aaron asked me, now insisted, no, insisted that I sign this. Because he tried to give this back to me without signing. And I said, I signed the stupid piece. And he's like, oh, for crying out of that. Because, you know, anybody who knows Hillary knows he's a curmudgeon. And uh, now this is, a, this is a big winner, too. This is, this is Mark Schultz. And uh, I went over to Schultz, and I said, Mark, uh, could I get you to do something with my sketchbook? What would you charge me? You know, I, I think I may have said, would you do something for, like, 300 bucks or 350 or whatever? This is probably 2007-ish. And, um, you know, and I said, um, he goes, well, what do you want? I think it was just like Conan or something, because he was working on the Conan book, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't ask him to do a babe. I just said, you know, Conan or something like that would be cool. And he says, I really hate drawing at shows there. And he said, can I take it home with me? And I said, absolutely. And he said, and he goes, I don't feel right about taking your money. He goes, let's trade. And I said, okay, you're an idiot. I'll do it. 
And I, I love Mark. He's a great guy. He's a very talented artist. But I was like, man, did I, did I make out on that deal? Yeah. And so I, I came back and, and he had it for several months. And I was getting close to Christmas time. And I was like, hmm, I want to get my book back because convention season's coming up. So I said, I need to start pressuring him. So, and I hadn't done the, the thing for him either. Mm. So I did this really nice, actually, Deja Thoris and uh, Tars Tarkas piece and sent it to him. Right. Cause I said, I, cause I knew Schultz was working on it. I was like, I can't do something half assed This has got to look good. So I did a pretty nice piece for him and sent it to him. And he got it. He was like, wow, it's amazing. I haven't even started yours. I said, that's all right. Take your time. But <laughs> the guilt had already set yeah. in. Right. So it was like two weeks later, he sent this back to me and I, he gave me this and you want to talk about me getting the best, you know, the best end of the deal here. Wow. So I have a Adam Hughes in here and a, a Mark Schultz in here. Now this, I should have Chris on mm. on the show to talk to him. Chris isn't a big talker though. I'd have to like squeeze information out of him, but he does character design for animation and um, he's a cancer survivor. And once he recovered from cancer, he started doing uh, these books called um, the, Daily the Daily Zoo. Zoo. Thank yeah. you. And that's Chris Ayers. Look him up on uh, Amazon. Really there's, good there's, stuff. Yeah, there's some, and so I, I got him to do a piece in my book, and this actually he featured in one of his books. And the Daily Zoo is basically, he said, to celebrate life, mm -hmm. that he survived cancer, that he would do an animal or creature drawing every day. And then he collected them all in a book because I think J.J. Abrams convinced him to do it, put them in a book because he was working for Abrams on some something. And um, so, so he did this for me, and I did him a Wonder Woman piece. Um, and this is 2009, and this didn't cost me anything. So that was, nice you love it when guys trade. Yep. Okay. So especially when they're, they're better than me, that's the beautiful thing. Cause you really make out like a bandit. Okay. So this Hillary Barta, and I just did this to piss Hillary off. Um, Cause he was walking around San Diego. I'm like, Hillary, what are you doing? No, I'm just looking around. I go, come back here and draw in my book. I don't want to draw your book. I was like, just come back here and draw in my book. You're not doing anything else. And so then he came back there, you know, all being all curmudgeonly and I asked him to draw the spirit. And he's like, oh, I didn't feel like drawing the spirit. So he drew this, like, kind of sort of this astro caveman blasting a hole in this alien's head. And it says, for Aaron, now leave me alone. Best of everything, Barta. And so I've got two pieces in Hillary Barta. And I swear to you, if I ever see him at a con again, I'm going to make him draw on it again just to really piss him off. Um, so anyway, but he that was very generous of him. Peter DeSev did this. Uh, Love we have an original of ours of, of his painting sitting up hanging on my wall, not sitting, but hanging. This, of course, is Scrat from Ice Age, which Peter did all of the design work for, the character design work for. And um, he was at San Diego doing a book signing. I remember going up to him and I said, I reintroduced myself to him because I'd met him a couple years before when his sketchbook came out, and Shelly and I bought some artwork from him. And I had mentioned that to him just to kind of warm him up. And I said, oh, by the way, would, could I get you to just draw like Scrat or something in my sketchbook? You know, would you be willing to do that? Oh, I don't really do sketchbooks. So I went, no, oh, no, that's okay. Just because I bought some artwork from you. No, I didn't say that. And But he was like, oh, okay, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. I don't remember how I talked him into it. So he, the funny thing is he did a Scrat and he didn't like it. He said, oh, that sucks. He goes, here, let me do another one. So we ended up doing two Scrats. He said, but I only do the second one if you take out the first one and throw it away. I said, deal. So I cut out the first one. And which actually damaged some of these pages. So some of these pages have tape on them because I had to go back in to repair the book because uh, I cut too deep on it. But anyway, so I couldn't throw, I'm not going to throw his artwork away. I would never do that. So it's stuffed over my drawer and will stay there uh, forever probably. Uh, but anyway, so he did that scrap for me. Then I come across David Williams, right? And um, 2009. And David Williams is sitting there and we're talking and he has, uh, he has this drawing by, um, Alex Nino, but Alex Nino it does really funky stuff. I mean, really out there funky stuff, right? So David pulls out this drawing, and I think it was Batman or something. I don't know what it was, but it was like it was like structurally it was really sound, but it had all the funkiness of an Alex Nino piece. Has he been out recently? He might need to go. Um, and so I said, "Well, what's going on here?" And he goes, "Well, I actually penciled this and gave it to him to ink it." And so that way I got what I wanted, but still with all the, the Nino kind of coolness to it. 
And so, um, so I took over my, my drawing pad, my 11 by 14 drawing pad, and I drew this zombie because I really, I, a friend of mine or a, a, a guy I know, an uh, acquaintance of mine that worked for comic book shows and stuff years ago, had this great original piece, a zombie piece that Nino had done for him. And it was like, it's one of my favorite Nino pieces I've ever seen. I'm like, man, I'd really like to have Nino do a zombie. So I said, so I penciled this pretty loosely, this drawing, right? And said, would you be interested in just inking this sketch of my pencils? He's like, yeah, sure. So he inked it. And then I went over there to pay him for it. And I'm like, how much? He goes, ah, just a tank of gas. And I'm like, okay, well, how much is that? What do you, you know? And I would, he would never give me a number. And then he finally just said, I'll just take it. And I'm like, I felt guilty, but he never, you know, it was like, I'm sure he felt guilty, like taking money from a fellow pro or something, but I was, you know, I was willing and able to pay him and I never did. So I, now I feel guilty. But so I took this back to my book and I was like, what an idiot. I had my book with me and I'm like, why didn't I do this in my book? So I cut this page out and glued it in my book. So it's actually now part of the book. This is Travis Charest. Travis didn't charge me for this either. Now I came up to him and I, I remember talking to him at a, at a con in San Jose and I said, we we're sitting next to you and I said, Travis, I, I got a sketchbook. Um, what would it take to get you in there? Can I like bring it next time, you know, next year and have you do something? Would you be willing to do something if I brought it? And he said, oh yeah, we can trade sketches. And I said, okay, great. So I went up to him at the show and I said, Travis, and we talked a little bit and I said, remember you said last year that, you know, you do something in my sketchbook and he's like, what and you know he's like did i and i'm like yeah you said you want to trade sketches so if you got you know well i didn't bring my sketchbook and i said well i brought mine and i see he said oh my gosh i go i was wondering if i could get a conan from you in here and he's like and he had a print of conan and he just pointed to the print and i said dude that's a print i want you to draw in my book and he's like oh, right fine so once again aaron lapresti pissing people off to get what he wants and he drew this for me and never charged me for it and never gave me a sketchbook so i still owe him and it would gladly do it for him in there if you ever did. But you notice the, the caption, Aaron, now you die. So he was quite pleased that I made him a, mm -hmm. do a sketch in the sketchbook. And then finally, finally, after years of friendship, Terry finally did a piece in the book. And that's Terry Dodson's piece. Um, that's some Russian agent or something. I don't know. He does a lot of European books, and I don't really know what all these characters are. But uh, so anyway, I just wanted a piece from Terry in here. I didn't care how elaborate it was or anything else like that. And I had done a sketch in Rachel's book years before, so I was always bugging Terry. I go, dude, you owe me. I did a, you know, you got to do something in mine. I finally pinned him down and got him to do it. And so then I think the last one. Now this is Penelope Gaylord, who I'm not going to say I discovered her, but. When I say I discovered somebody, I mean discovered them for me. Yeah, I'd never heard of her before, and I saw an artist alley at uh, some place. And I, I, she did Disney characters and stuff. And you can follow her on um, Instagram. I think she's Peng 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 P E N G P E N G. And her name is Penelope Gaylord, and she was, you know, had these wonderful drawings. And I was like, how much you charge for commissions? She goes, $100. I go, you charge $100 for a color commission? She goes, yes. And I go, uh, wait right here. And I went back and got my book, handed it to her. It was Baltimore. And I said, uh, tangled, please. And uh, so she did it. And look at that piece in there for 100 bucks. She probably charged, if she's smart, she probably charges more than that now. But because uh, she's done like, she does like, uh, like some of those golden books and stuff for Disney and things like that. So it's just wonderful stuff. And so that was the last person. And that was years ago. And I just have, you better get after it, little Presty. Yeah. So anyway, there's a trip down memory lane to kind of break things up. Well, and I think it's funny it's that Jeff was like, you know, your stories are like, oh yeah, and then I was hanging out with David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? How about a song about an astronaut? What was that all about, man? Uh, about them. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Wow, Hilary Barter's horror art is fantastic. It really is. He's he's such a uh, he's such a heavy influence of like Wally Wood and other EC artists 
and writes in it, of course. And of course, he has that humorous kind of slant to it. And then, and then Mick, Mick Jagger Jack came, came over. over for chicken. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Let's see. Good Winston, morning, good morning, Winston. Winston. Thanks for joining us. Oh, Winston, make sure you uh, go and check out part one later because that's the interview with uh, Walter and Wheezy Simonson. So you don't want to miss that. Um, uh oh. Uh oh. Yes, you can ask me something in all seriousness. Where's Mike Miller's Miller's drawing? Only I only get the top professionals to work in my book. So, Henri, <laughs> I'd have a lot more in there if I remember to bring this book with me when I go to shows, but I keep forgetting. So we're we're patiently waiting for Johnny's question. Mm. Um, actually, should we um should we re revisit the table? Um, I don't know. It's up to you guys. Not really. Yet. We'll do another. What you gonna draw now? We're drawing uh, which I had you look at the oh. reference for. Oh, booyah! There you have it. I forgot that was so long ago. <laughs> well, you know, I got off on a tangent and. Uh, had to tell my David Bowie stories, and uh, you know that's, that's a pretty good question. Oh, there's your legs. Oh, sorry, people. These questions. Are... Do you ever feel alone or isolated in this industry? Like anything you do doesn't matter or no one notices that you contribute to comics? Mm, yeah, like right now, yes. Um, I'm. There's two ways to really look at that. It's kind of like, I don't really hang out with a lot of people when I go to shows and stuff. I'm even worse now. I mean, I go to a show and just go to my room. Um, and so, to say I feel isolated, yeah, sometimes because I don't, I haven't really done a good enough job of establishing long term relationships with people. I mean, I had, I was really close with Paul Ryan before he passed away. Um, I consider, you know, Simonson's good friends, but we don't see them all that often. They're on the East Coast. Right. But, you know, if I'm at a show or something, I'll talk to them and, uh, um, just the work alone is isolating. isolating. Right. And you really never know what someone thinks, right? So you you judge your success based on the next job they give you if they give you a next job. And sometimes they don't. And then you're sort of like... And you question yourself, but you have to be confident in what you do. And then you realize how many other factors play into the decisions that editors make and whether it's fair or not. Right. It doesn't really matter. Right. Um, whether they... know what they're doing or not or whatever i don't know how to say that appropriately but yeah so to answer your question yes in a, in a manner of speaking i i do go through that you think am i have i accomplished anything does anybody even care um you know and like i'm really putting my um self on the line a little bit by having announced i'm going to be doing a kick mm -hmm. uh, um a crowdfunded book because you know if I can't get it off the ground what does that say about me right and so and there's a but still even then there's a lot of factors did you reach enough people you know because you got to believe there's enough people out there that oh yeah I could I could get this funded but can I reach those people in time so I mean mm -hmm. I, so there's just so many factors and so many things but yeah I I, I look at other artists that I think are more successful than me and there's quite a bit of them quite frankly and you know you you get i don't want to say jealous but it, you can get it can kind of be depressing if you let it you know but i think i um you know you do the best you can and that's just kind of how it goes you know i don't want to get all preachy on everybody but i have pretty strong faith and i kind of i kind of look at things big i try to look at things big picture as opposed to 
you know, how popular I am or something like that to define me as a person. Because I don't have control over that. I can only do the best I can do. And if, you know, if people don't respond to it, well, what are you going to do, right? You just keep working. And I have, I have quite a bit of resolve. And when I feel that I've failed or that I'm not getting it done, I work really hard to get better so that I can get it done because I enjoy nothing more than proving people wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and your self-worth doesn't come from everything external. That's for sure. It shouldn't anyway. Right. And certainly not from the internet. Although my self-worth comes from the show and how many people are watching it. So watch, please. Oh, hey, what? that reminds me. What? Nice segue. Yeah. Nice. See, so I have to. Yeah, so if you haven't uh, subscribed to my channel, please subscribe to my do channel. It, do it now. For the good of all, really, mankind, I think, is how I want yeah. to put that. Eric Boyd, he's quoting Cheap Trick. Yep. Everything works if you let it. Mm hmm. Just see how my character. What is this? I don't even understand these half these comments. Did I miss something? Well, putting yourself out there with your characters. And oh, I see. You just say your characters are transitioning. Oh my gosh. It is. It's like, you know what? Comics, the reality is, comics is like a mini Hollywood. It's exactly like Hollywood. Yeah. Exactly, except without the money. Yeah. But the attitudes and the way people treat people in a lot of the ways is exactly the same. Yeah. So I was not, shall we say, thrilled when our daughter wanted to go into art. Yeah. But again, everybody has their path. And sometimes, you know, what you think is your path, you know, it's just keep doors open and then who knows where those doors will lead to. Yeah, there's really there's a really interesting I used to have this quote by Rona Barrett of all people. Okay. Now if you don't know who Rona Barrett was, she was a daytime talk show host, sort of an entertainment you remember Rona Barrett? She kind of had the white beehive oh, kind yeah. of attractive gal, but she had yeah. kind of the yeah. premature gray or silver hair or white hair. And she um, would have like she was like on morning shows or whatever and she had she was like the entertainment kind of gossip kind of person and she would interview people and have entertainment stories and you know it's pretty popular but then she just sort of fell out of favor as people do in the entertainment industry for any number of reasons and then she just disappeared for a while right and this was kind of like she was big in the 70s and then kind of in the uh in the later 70s she disappeared and then she kind of re-emerged you know five or six years later on doing similar stuff on a different channel or i can't remember exactly what the circumstances were but I remember reading this article on her and I cut the quote out and I used to have it on my, my drafting table and it did simply said, she goes, and this is a paraphrase. So I don't remember exactly how the quote went, but she said, um, even during the, the, the most dark days, this is how she kept positive. She said, even during the most dark days, she always held out hope for tomorrow because you never know when you're going to get that one phone call that's going to change your life. And that's, yeah. and that's honestly the truth. I could be completely unemployed right now. I'm not saying that I am, but I'm just saying I could be unemployed right mm -hmm. now and think, oh my gosh, I'm going to be starving in 30 days. What do I do? And then I could get an email tomorrow, someone offering me a job right. that, you know, so you just don't know. You can't assume anything. Worry about what you're dealing with today. You know, and deal with that and worry about tomorrow when tomorrow comes. It's an easy thing to say, but that's really a well, and all you can do is the best you can do. right. Oh, so if nice I one. was uh, if I was in a peanut strip, you'd have to put five cents in my can right now. Lucy, are you and Charlie Lucy? Brown? I was just gonna say, yeah. this is uh. I was unaware of your work until seeing you on the redesigning Supergirl drawn and quartered the other day, but now I'm on board with whatever you have planned for the future. Thank you, Fox. You know, that's an interesting thing. 
because that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. You disrespect, no, I'm kidding. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about where you can be in an industry for, what I've been doing this almost 30 years, 30 years, right? And yet I will constantly run into people that have either never heard of me, never seen my work. And I think, my gosh, how could they have not seen my work? But most people that buy comics, and I say most people are, how should we say, um, light consumers. They'll buy Batman, they'll buy Superman, they'll buy Wonder Woman, but they're not going to go buy that Metamorpho miniseries over there that Aaron drew or wrote. And they're not mm -hmm. going to go pick up that anthology that has a garbage man story in it or whatever. And I, I, I built a massive career on working on stuff that people don't read and avoiding projects that people actually would well, read. And, and you became the, uh, the guy that won't miss deadlines. So then you became in this, oh, we need to bail out so-and-so and Lil Presti will get us caught up because yeah, he's I was, a workhorse. Yeah, I mean, that's not to say that, that I wasn't, you know, first choice on right books at on occasion because i was but it was also you know you know i got i got jobs because i was reliable too which was always a good thing i mean dan didio once told me said aaron you're never going to have to worry about getting work because we can always count on you to do a good right. job and get it done on time and then dan got fired and well you know everything changes so um such as the industry but to get to fox Mulder's point i mean i've been doing this a long time but if you don't have like a five or six year run on Wonder Woman or you didn't redesign Thor and make it something special and work on it for two or three years like Walter or you don't, you know, I was I've always worked on sort of middle of the road books with the exception of short run on Planet Hulk, which wasn't all me. I shared it with somebody else and he gets all the recognition, um, which is fine because he did all the design work. Carlos did a great job in that book. And the only reason I got on it was because he couldn't keep the deadline. So I had to go in and, and do alternative story arcs with him. And then, of course, I had the two-year run on Wonder Woman where I got some recognition. But as cult popular as Wonder Woman is, she doesn't sell that well in the big scheme of things. And she never has. So even though I'm best known for my work on Wonder Woman, that's still not saying that much because you're talking about a book that sold 30,000 copies. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, so... You know, I did Ms. Marvel, but again, it wasn't a huge selling book when I was working on it. Um, you know, and I did some X-Men books, but I, again, I never had a long run. It was three issues here, a couple issues there. Um, I did Excalibur with Chris, Chris Claremont, but that was never a, the popular X book. It was all the other X books that were the ones that everybody was reading. So, but you also didn't have a huge social media presence and stuff. Right until more recently right there but there's that and that's why i do this now is so right. people can be aware of my work because it's a whole new landscape right you know and if i can't if i'm not doing stuff that you're reading and it's not necessarily because oh you know well aaron's doing that i'm not going to read it you may not even be aware of it right so how do you make people aware of it you do stuff like this and um and like fox Mulder pointed out i just happened to show up on mike miller's right. live stream and he had never seen my work before until he saw me on there. And so, and now he, he's supporting well, and me it took, and I appreciate that. It took that. you a while because, okay, I'll, I'll be honest. I set up a YouTube channel for you a few years ago, probably two years ago. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I'm not exaggerating when I say this guy will work. You know, he takes a break to let me pick up our daughter from school, take her to dance pick her up for dance, make dinner. But other than that, he's working. He'll stay up till 2 a.m. working. If he's not physically working, he's thinking about working. So there wasn't a lot of time. Well, and that's, that's the other issue with stuff like this is that you have to make a decision. Do I want to be an artist or do I want to be a promoter? Because they're two full-time jobs right. and you really have to be both in this day and age. And um, so that's kind of what I'm juggling right now is being a full-time promoter and a full-time artist. Um, and it's hard to, to cover everything, to be honest with you. Yeah. So that's the moral of that story. There you have it, folks. And even if you remember this morning, those of you guys who tuned in for the interview with the Simonsons, Walter made a point about how things had changed and he, you know, that Marvel had come to him 
and asked him to do a um, a Thor. If he if he would write and draw a Thor annual, right? And he didn't know that he because he was working on the Ragnarok stuff, and he said I didn't. He didn't know if he had time to to do to write and draw it. But he said to the editor, he goes, "You know what? You know this might be kind of fun. Let me um, what if, what if I ask John Byrne see if he's interested in doing it, right?" Now, of course, John Byrne is as big a you know a legend in the industry as Simonson is, right? And so, um, so he contacts John, and and Byrne says, "Yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's do it." So he goes back to the editor, right, and tells the editor, he says, or the assistant editor, whoever, who talked to him about this, and he said, yeah, John's on board for it, you know? And the guy said, well, I can't really green light that. Let me, let me check and see, and I'll get back to you. And Walter laughed, and he said, they ended up neither one of them doing it. But, um, and they didn't hear back for several days, right? And he said, you know, he goes, it just goes to show you, he said that, you know, there was a time where I could have gone to Marvel and said, we've got a book project. Simonson and Byrne are going to be involved in, and they people would have been knocking down doors mm -hmm. to let them do it. They and, and now they had to discuss it. Like right. that would even. I mean, who would even? I would say immediately. I'd go do it. Right. And but no, they had to. You know, they couldn't okay it. They had to think about it. And it was like, you know, so even when you're a, you get to a point where you're a superstar, it's fleeting. You know, you're constantly having to reinvent yourself and prove yourself and because different people come into power and they don't have respect for your stuff anymore. Um, oh, you're old fashioned or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, like, I, I, I just can't even imagine that. If Simonson came to me and said, hey, Aaron, you know, let's say I had a company, right? And he said, oh, I'd love to do something for you. I wouldn't even ask him what it was. I would just say, whatever you want, man, do it. Yeah. Because you know it's going to be good. So. You've really made a, uh, more put yourself out there more on like the professionals and all that. It's true. Well, I've, I've come to realize that it is this, this is the wave of the future. If there is going to be a yeah. future in comics, it just starts right here on the interweb. The <laughs> interweb. Okay. Can we switch now to the yeah. other picture that Terry did so I can see the costume from the front? Uh, uh, no. Yes. Oh. Or that. I just want to see what's going on with the shoulders. I think I got it, don't I? Yeah. Actually, he's got them a little bit thicker, though. And is there anything else? No, she's got a collar, but she doesn't, there's no, like, any sort of accoutrements or anything on there. She's got a little thing here. So he kept the sash from her when she was... Ms. Marvel. Okay. I think that's it. So it's red and blue, right? Yeah, so don't lose that so I can remember the color scheme when I get there. Okay. So yeah, I didn't mean to get all heavy on everybody, but you know. The point of all this is that no matter how great you are or were or whatever at any period of time that time is fleeting and um, and everybody goes through ups and downs and uh, you know and, and goes through periods of times where people just don't think you're relevant anymore and so and that you know your artwork may be just as good or in my case better than it's ever been but you know as I get older so that's true of some people it's not true of other people but um, you know, it's just amazing how you can fall out of favor so quickly. And sometimes that's just, you know, at DC, all the editors, you know, get fired in September and that's a true story. Right. So, so suddenly now I'm like, wait a minute. Well, and some of the people that are in there think that that's their end to Warner brothers. So maybe they're not really comic book people. So they don't know everything they probably should or could. Right. But it's like it, check on things. Yeah, yeah, it's like anything else. There's always you're gonna have up and down, ups and downs, you're gonna have ins and outs, you're gonna have 
you know, even something as simple as, you know, Shelley being a teacher, you think, well, that's, well, if the administration changes and suddenly you, you get in conflict with someone in the administration, you go from being their favorite teacher to not which their favorite happened teacher, to me. which happened to Shelly. So, and it, I was, you're my best hire ever. She retires. And then all of a sudden I am having to file grievances and I'm being harassed and it was yeah. horrible. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, you do the best you can. And then when things change and inevitably they do, you look for a new avenue to which you can get your stuff out there and hopefully find an audience of people that appreciate what you're doing and what you're trying yeah. to do. And that's not easy, but. Yeah. yeah, I went from being the district trainer for the math curriculum to, we need to meet with these people and blah, 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 blah. And asking kids to write letters of complaint against me and that kind of stupid stuff. So you just never know. And not to toot my own horn, but toot, toot. Yep. I'm pretty good. She's a pretty good teacher. Worked very hard. Yep. Uh, Xander's work was before sludge, though. Maybe Marvel presents or what the. If you remember that far yeah. back, you deserve a round of <laughs> applause. <laughs> I was buying the entire Ultraverse line. I was putting a hole in my young wallet. <laughs> uh, I did buy what, what the, but aside from Byrne and maybe Hillary Barr, I didn't think I noticed a lot of the artists thing. My stuff was crap. Although I was doing the um, Forbish Man stories, which I had a lot of fun with. Um, I was getting to write them and I was drawing them and inking them. And I was at the time sort of a sort of, finding myself as a penciler and I was way far away from finding myself as an anchor. And, uh, so it wasn't, the work was fairly clunky in a lot of ways. Uh, but I think the most valuable thing I got out of that was all the writing I got to do. Hmm. Well, you know, that's probably true. And um, I, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's true. But I, that's why I asked him how many pages he had left, because I was wondering how long do I have to wait for an omnibus so I can, you know, get the whole thing in one one thing. And uh, but I think he, he said the, the, the either in, the intention was to trade each story segment or because he did like six issue, these six issue miniseries, right? And so the uh, the idea was to get them traded so I, I assume that even if comic books are sold out you can't get the comics that we should be able to get the trades right or are you are, are you talking about the oh the hardcovers okay well I got to I got to imagine if they did a hardcover that it's pretty small print run Um, oh, sorry, I almost forgot. Oh, what was I thinking? Um, it, it was, it was written into our contracts. I say our contracts because Kevin McGuire had the same situation as I did with his, uh, Tanga, which was actually quite good, by the way. And um, upon the contract that we signed with them for these characters was basically we retained ownership, but they would pay us a fee, which I think was like $2,500 or something, right? And that was a licensing fee. So, ne But their licensing agreement lasted forever, okay? So basically they paid us $2,500 and then they had rights to these characters forever however there was a stipulation in the contract that the characters had to be used every 
three years or every five years, something like that. And, um, and all they had to do was they had to go to us and say, hey, um, we want to do a garbage man, say Halloween special one shot, right? And then I could, then I had the, I had the, the right of first refusal, but I couldn't stop them from doing it. Okay. So in other words, they came to me and said, Aaron, we want to do a Halloween special with garbage man. Do you want to write and draw it? And I would say, eh, I don't really want to do that. Then they could give it to somebody else, right? Not the ownership of the character, but the, let someone else, you know, write and draw it. Uh, of course, which I would never do under any circumstances, but I guess there's a, there's a possibility where you could be say, you're, you're drawing Superman, right? Or you're drawing Batman and this comes up and they say, Hey, and quite frankly, if they, if I had been drawing Batman, they probably would have wanted to keep the character, just me doing it. Cause my popularity level would have been much different. Um, so all they had to do was basically create a, an appearance for the character that I would write and draw once every five years or something like that. Right. It could even have been a guest shot. They could have said, Hey, we're doing this. You know, we want garbage man to cross over into this. Do you want to do it? Right. And, but, and if they did that, then the, their rights would renew for another five years. And then, you know, they wouldn't have to do anything with the character again until that five year was up. Well, time went by and it was actually more like seven or years, you know, and, and, and Kevin and I started asking about it. It's like, Hey, what's the deal with this? Can we, can we get our rights back to this? If you guys aren't going to use the character, can we get our rights back to these characters? And so this process started and I remember having this conversation with Kevin at um, Seattle. I think it was, I, you know, cause we were talking about getting the rights back cause he actually really started it. Cause I was doing other things and I was like, ah, you know what? I wouldn't have time to do anything with the character anyway, because I was working on whatever I was working on right for DC at the time. Well, so we have this conversation and I told him, I said, I said, Kevin, they're never going to give us these characters back. He says, why? You know? And I said, because all they have to do is a one shot once every five years and they can maintain the characters. And I said, and why wouldn't they do that? Why would you not maintain an intellectual property at such a minimal expense? You know, especially if you're a big company like Warner Brothers, whether or not, you know, they did a garbage man one shot and it sold is irrelevant. They just upped their IP for another five years and they probably at least would break even with the thing, even if they didn't make any money. So why wouldn't you do it? Well, for whatever, some reason they didn't do it. They, they said, no, you guys can have them back. And they gave them back to us. And so it was just, you know, sign some paperwork and the, the rights reverted back to us. Now I think Kevin has got Tanga. He finally, he's releasing it digitally, which I find interesting because I know, you know, he could go to dark horse like I did or someplace else and get someone to actually put that in print. I don't know why he wouldn't have pursued that Avenue. I don't know. Maybe he wanted just to, to be under his control. Um, because with, 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 with Dark Horse, they basically, it's a licensing agreement with them, not for publishing the comic, but for licensing the character, right? And I mean, quite frankly, if Dark Horse is better set up to sell that character to a TV market or a movie market than I am, right? And so they have the rights for five years or something like that. Now they may only publish the trade paperback and that may be the only thing that Dark Horse ever does with the character, but they'll still maintain the rights of exploitation of that character, which is fine because if they can sell it as a movie, I still get a large part of that. I mean, they get a large part of it too, but I don't care. They're doing all the work to sell it. So I don't really have a problem with that. Um, I still have the ownership of the character, but I basically essentially hired them as my agent for five years to rep the thing, you know? which I'm totally fine with. They're, like I said, they're in a much better position to uh, get that sold if it is a property that anybody would be interested in anyway. I don't know. But they're in a better position to sell it than I am. Um, this is 
you know, there's some truth into this. But here's here's the issue with part of that is the fact that it's just IDW, right? No one. Um, I mean, I, I don't mean to speak ill of IDW or any other small publisher, but it's kind of like we were talking about, you know, me doing videos or whatever. They have such a small market share that most people aren't really paying attention to what they're doing. And so Simonson's, you know, doing his own version of Thor. And you would think that people would be like, holy crap. I guarantee you if he did it through Marvel, it'd sell 100 times more. Well, I mean, not 100 times more, but 10 times more. Maybe 20 times more. Um, it's kind of like when I did Power Cubed. And some of you may be scratching your head going, what the heck is that? Um, that was a creator on book I did through Dark Horse. But it really would have been better off as, um, there it is right there, as an image book. Uh, it doesn't really suit the Dark Horse sort of, dark, Garbage Man is much more a Dark Horse book. This was more an image book. But I did it through Dark Horse because they gave me a little bit of money up front. And um, and so I was able, and I was still working pretty heavily at DC at the time, so I could I could work on this in my spare time. And then whenever I got it done, they published it. So and I got a little bit of money up front for doing it. So you know it worked out okay, uh, but it didn't sell worth garbage, right? And so and I, actually, I was really, really, really disappointed. I think it sold like five thousand copies, and I was like, and I was pushing this as hard as I could, and for over a year, and I thought. But I didn't have my YouTube channel. I didn't, you know, it's just at social media like everybody else. And again, I didn't have that many followers. I still don't have a huge amount of followers on Twitter. I'm getting better, but, you know, still not a ton. And so I did the best I could to promote the book. But, you know, how many people even knew about it? I mean, how many people right now in this, this that are watching have ever even heard of this? But it is, uh, it's available through Amazon or whatever else you want to get copies of it. Uh, and it's actually quite entertaining. Uh, it's a fun, old-fashioned kind of comic. Um, and I ended up actually, the money I got from Dark Horse, almost all of it went to the inkers and the colorists. Because I, I inked the first issue myself. And it took me six months. Because I was working on it in my spare time, right? So it took me six months. To pencil and ink one issue and it was a four issue miniseries i was like this is never going to get done if i don't get someone else to ink it and i couldn't ask someone to you know ink it for cut rate so i had to pay people their full rate and that took up you know what little advance i got from dark horse but so i ended up drawing it writing and drawing it for essentially free and then i never made a dime on it but it got out and um the people that work on it got paid, so other than me, and so that's fine. You know, it was my project. I took a chance on it. I thought it might have some animation legs, and maybe it does. You know, ten years from now, it might be an animated show. Who knows? Because um, this stuff never happens very quickly, or very rarely does it happen quickly, if at all. But Power Cube is also part of the little Presti verse, and of course, I have all the rights back to that because. Uh, Dark Horse found no interest in that book and it didn't sell well, so they just, you know, our uh, partnership of them, um, kind of like I have with Garbage Man, that they, you know, had their their rights to exploit it if they could find someone to, you know, to do something with it, which they never did, and so I've got it back again, totally under my control if I do anything with it. But I have no problem giving up, you know, like half ownership of something in exchange for getting it made into something. Because owning 50% of something is better than owning 100% of nothing. And, you know, so I've never been all that sort of, um, I, I, let me put it this way, I sympathize with publishers in the sense that Hey, they're the one providing the money and taking the financial risk. You're you're putting your time in, of course. Um, but they, I understand that without them financing, nothing happens. So, mm. what do we got here? <laughs> uh, 
like I said, Dave, half of uh, half of nothing is still um, still nothing. See, there's a perfect example. Look at Hyper Potato. He know he didn't know about it, and he tried to get all my books. Promotion is extremely important and difficult. Now, see, Dave Ulbrich has heard of it. Um, let's see here. Mr. Law, thank you for joining. There you go. Never to park cubed before now. See, I'm talking about, it's all about promotion. So, um, yeah, so I don't really have anything to gain from it by promoting it right now. Uh, you know, maybe a couple trade paperback sales. It's probably not even print anymore. You know, whatever they got sitting around at Dark Horse. Um, I may buy them up and put them as part of my um, Wraith of God campaign. That seems like a very likely scenario for me. Um, what do you guys think? Should I bring Dave Ulbrich in and talk about Ultraverse in the good old days? Shelly's bailed on me a little bit, so, you know. I promised you guys a surprise guest, and uh, I was trying to get Terry, but uh, he's got can't good can't get away, or at least I haven't heard from him, so I'm assuming he can't get away. Dave, are you going to be around for a while? Are you uh, free for an hour or so? People want Dave. People want Dave. Look at the the crowd is chanting. All right, let's invite Dave in. Give me one second as we pause here. Oh, Dave's in St. Louis? Oh. Oh, I was just going to send you an invite. Okay, Dave's not <laughs> Dave's not here, man. That's a Cheech and Chong reference right there. <laughs> oh, Dave, you got everybody all excited. No, we don't want Mike Miller. Miller is nothing but trouble. Mike's probably doing a live stream right now. Oh, let me see if anybody, uh, no, no, have heard nothing from Terry, so it's getting late, so I'm guessing he's probably, uh, well, the thing with Terry, Terry's a very outdoorsy kind of guy. If it's nice weather, he is outdoors doing something fun and entertaining and not uh, sitting by his computer, I can tell you that. Me, I don't believe, this is fun to me. I'm kind of sad now. I was kind of excited about maybe having Dave regale us with um, his tales of uh, yesteryear. Uh, Dave, <laughs> I'm not even. I... Yeah, you know. I don't even know how to respond. I'm glad, Dave. No, I'm glad I'm not bringing you on. I'm pretty sure that Terry. Uh, there's a story behind this that. Uh, you know what? I thought he did, but I'm not going to go out on a limb, because someone else might have designed it, and then he redesigned it, and I can't remember exactly. Um. Yeah, so I'm not going to go down that path and say something that maybe is not true and then incite violence. So, um, but I know Terry had some sort of, uh, 
some sort of involvement in it. Let me just leave it at that. So now we're going back to the land of uh, Worm Zero. That's right, I don't need any guests. I was thinking about inviting Kelly Jones in. I don't know Kelly really well, so I thought, no, well, you know, I didn't know if he'd be up for it or not, especially on a weekend. I think it's a lot easier to get guys you know, during the week. Um, you know who I'd really love to talk to? You know what, I, I'm gonna do that. You guys know who Mark Nelson is? I love his stuff, and I have not talked to him. He's the sweetest guy, and he's a great artist. He drew the original uh, black and white Aliens adaptation for Dark Horse back in like the late 80s, right, when Dark Horse was a brand new thing. Um, well, this is, who's the best superhero costume designer? Um, well, for my money, Gil Kane, and because Gil, there was never any extra stuff on there. It was all about figure drawing, and uh, you know he painted on costumes, and that's that's my favorite. I don't like like Iron Man, for example. I do not like this actual more realistic, if you could even say that, uh, or practical, maybe a better way to put that. Iron Man armor. I like the old Gene Colan Bendy armor, right? Because again, you're doing you're it's basically figure drawing. And that's what we all really love to do. And when you've got costumes that have just a bunch of crap on them that cover up the figure, then they're not as much fun. And that's, you know, again, that's my personal taste. Um, we don't need no stinking guests. We got everybody in the comments section. Uh, yeah, he is a little bit, but I, I just read he posted something that he's doing some monster designs for the next season of The Mandalorian. So how about that? That's pretty cool. Um, that's good work if you can get it. Um, yeah, I could get Tom Mason. Tom's, Tom's always good for like a literally a million laughs, but I don't even know how to get a hold of him. If he's not on Facebook right now, he's probably not even paying attention. So if Dave was actually, if, if Tom was actually in the chat, I would invite him in. But since he's not, I probably can't even, uh, wouldn't be able to get his attention. Dave, if you're sitting in a hotel room, why can't you come on? I think that's a, I think that's a reasonable question. I mean, there is such a thing as technology, which you're using right now to contribute to the chat, so I don't see any reason why you couldn't come on the show. Let's see what, how Dave defends that position. Oh, Gene Colan was amaze balls. Um, you know, I was. There's some stuff I really loved about Gene Colan. There's other stuff that I thought was just too wonky for me. Like sometimes his figure work got just out of control. But he would draw these close-ups. I remember him like of Captain America when he had the short when he had that run on Captain America around when I was at issues like 114 and 115 and somewhere in that neighborhood, the first Falcon and that kind of stuff. He would draw these close-ups of Captain America when he did these beautiful eyes and the eyelashes and everything, and they were just so well done, you know? And I love that stuff, like the close-ups and stuff. But then sometimes his figure work got like so wonky and he had these people with these big old feet sometimes and it, it was weird, but I did like Gene Colan, I really did. Mike says his chat need to send you the love. Well, I appreciate it. Jeff, are you are you switching back and forth? That's what I'm guessing. I mean, you send our love right back to Mike. 
And I understand that this is usually his time slot, but when you're doing Aaron Con, you just, you know, you push everybody else out of the way. You have no friends. And of course, the great thing about this live streaming stuff is you can go back and watch it later if you missed, you know, say, you know what, I don't get all uptight if, you know, what my live numbers are. I, you know, I pay attention to what the overall numbers are, you know, but once the thing's been up a week, how many people have actually looked at it. But the night you're doing it, you know, you're in competition with like, usually like, there's probably a hundred other people live streaming right now. There might be a thousand people live streaming right now. Um, so. Stream sniping Aaron Khan. Okay, Mike, are you are you doing your own live stream or not? Are you doing like the art auction thing? What are you doing tonight? See, I'm I'm plugging your show right in the middle of my show. That's that's beautiful, is what that is. And that's the kind of thing that should make all of you want to watch my show instead of Mike's, because I'm willing to do that. I was looking for the W1 and well, look, it's in my hand. A little bit of a smudge there that's kind of ticking me off. So I want to fix that right now because it's driving me nuts. You guys can't see it, but. Go in over the top with a little bit of white pencil to eliminate the smudge. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, I'm streaming your stream. You're streaming my stream. <laughs> Look at that. Now, see, there you go. There it is. That's what I like to see. Don't cross the streams. Mm. There you go. Elliot is also done with you. Wow. Don't cross them. Join them. Oh, for crying out loud, Dave is like, you're going to send me an invite or what? So now he wants on? First he says he can't come on, and now he's giving me crap because, okay, I'm going to send you the link, Dave, who can't make up his mind whether he wants to be on the show or not. All right, here it comes. I have to go to Facebook. Please excuse me while I go to Facebook and drop this link. The wavy Davy Olbrich. Do 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 crying out loud. Um, search Dave. This is what we call bad TV, folks. All right, here we go. All right, I just I just sent you a link, Dave. So don't give me any garbage. Show up, entertain the masses. Oh, there he is. We came in quick. Ladies and gentlemen, 
former publisher of the Ultraverse line of comics, Malibu Comics, ladies and gentlemen, the ever popular, always cheerful Dave Ulbrich. Big hand, there he is. Yay! Look at hey, me. Hey. All right, see, I knew you could figure out the technology and come on board. I can't I move. Oh, there we go. Whatever. So you're in St. Louis for something? Is this um, like, is, are you the, fast? The, the Olympic trials. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought. You're uh, shot putting? What are you doing? <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the, the high bar and the balance beam. Okay, well. Yeah. I think that should I the dismounts are what I hear are really spectacular when you you uh, you go for the dismount. So I'm looking forward to Trust that. Trust me, everybody wants me to dismount. See, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave, I brought you in for one reason. One reason only. Oh God. Because you're a man who can regale us with stories of yesteryear. Um how did you guys go? See, I'm ready prepared with questions. How do you guys? I, you're not you, really prepared. You just have nonsense already stuck in your head. That's all. No, no, no. I am prepared, man. Did you see my interview with uh, Walter and Wheezy Simonson this morning? I didn't. No, that's why. That's kind of what I thought I was going to get when I clicked the link. Oh, see, you didn't pay attention to the time. <laughs> instead, 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 we get this weird picture where I don't have any idea what's going on with Carol Pelvis. What is the deal in that drawing? Oh my gosh! All right. You wait till it gets finished. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, sure you. I'm sure it'll look lovely when you're done. We're gonna, uh, right. we're gonna take a break here and do a little impromptu interview with uh, with Wavy Dave Albrich. Now, uh, how, how how is Walter? I love him. He's fabulous. I like uh, that. He's one. He's the he's the best guy in comics. I find. I mean, you might be able to find somebody as good. You'll nobody. You'll never find anybody better than Walter. He, that's that's true. He, they are so nice. They're the best yeah. people. And uh, I met them both at a Seattle show. Shelly and I did. And they invited me to stay, you know, the next time I was in New York. You know what I mean? I stayed at their house. I was like, they don't even know right. me. You know? They're just yeah, no, I, I, I've been to their house two or three times. One time when they came to San Diego Con, um, for some reason they were driving up the coast. I think they have friends in California or whatever. And I ended up at the Ventura County Fair with Walter and Louise Simonson. How cool was that? Like we went to a county fair together. It was so it was it was one of the most surreal moments ever. Like that's hey, so hey Walter, crazy. would you like this this straw hat? Can we can we buy you a <laughs> can we buy you a corn dog? It was <laughs> it's unbelievable, but it's true. They're just like, you know. Yeah. It, anyway, you should. It's a ninety-minute interview, and it, it was actually really kind of fun. So you should check it out when you get some free time. No, I absolutely will. I, I no, I, Walter's one of my favorite people, and being able to publish Star Slammers was one of the great joys of my life for sure. Now, but here's the question, Dave. Yep. You guys put together um, Malibu. Well, actually, what was it before Malibu? When you guys were doing dinosaurs for hire and stuff, was it still Malibu? It was, it was all. It was always Malibu. It started out Malibu, but we ended up like hoovering up like a vacuum cleaner, a bunch of old, a bunch of imprints that would have died otherwise. Right. And we we were so desperate for sales that basically we would slap whatever logo for the company name on it that we thought would make it sell the most copies. So for a while, we were publishing most of our stuff as Eternity just because more retailers were willing okay. to stock Eternity than right. were willing to stock Malibu. And it was just a, it was just a name familiarity thing. So how did you guys, how did, and I know we had this discussion, I think we were actually in downtown Disney, if you remember, having a similar discussion about the image stuff uh, a couple of years ago at uh, WonderCon. Yep. And, um, <clears throat> but you guys were Malibu slash Eternity Comics. Did you, when you heard about the image stuff, did you just guys go, wow, we've got an opportunity in here, let's move in kind of thing? Or how did that come about? Well, Rob wanted to go do stuff that wasn't associated with Marvel or DC because he just wanted more freedom, right? Right. And, and he'd been doing guest covers on, on and off for us for years. So he was already, we were already familiar with him. So... He came to us when he wanted to do something else. And so the first thing that he wanted to do 
well, I kind of nudged him in this direction. The first thing I said that I thought he should do if he wanted to go solo that we would, could help him with would be an art book. Because that way he wouldn't have to produce a whole bunch of new stuff. We could just take a bunch of the stuff that he had in the drawer already, and we could do a nice long interview, and then we'd have a book that he right. could own, right? So um, I came up with Extreme, The Art of Rob Liefeld, because we wanted to exploit the hell out of the word, the letter X somehow. <laughs> and so it's going to be Extreme, The Art of Rob Liefeld. And, um, and so that was well into its process. I mean, the other day I found the whole the galleys for the whole book. Like the whole interview and the blank pages where we we're gonna we we're gonna put certain pieces of artwork and some of the artwork was actually in there. Like the book is was basically done; it just never got published because every you know the shit hit the fan in other ways. Oops, sorry, language warning there. Family show. This is yeah. a family show, Dave. Yeah, sorry. Now it's it's too late. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so. Um, the point is, we were already talking with Rob about doing stuff. Meanwhile, Rob was talking to Eric and Jim Valentino and Todd about doing something else, like team, finding a way to team up and how what, would that, what shape would that take and how would that um, exist, right? Right. So while we're developing... We're talking to him about executioners. Maybe we could be the pub. Maybe Malibu could be the publisher of executioners. We were definitely doing extreme the art of Rob Liefeld book, and then these other talks were going on simultaneously. So we just get a call. One well, there was two or three calls before that where Rob says, "You know, we're talking about this or that." And then there's that famous dinner at uh, San Diego that Jim Valentino also talks about, where it was him and R Eric and uh, Rob, and they asked me if I would publish books by any of them. And it's like, well, what am I insane? Of course I would. I got three. I got, you know, I'm, 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 I'm publishing comics just to, you know, keep, keep myself, keep the gas tank and the, in the, in the, and the rent paid. Right. Um, and here's three marble artists that want to do their own thing. Why would I publish their own book? Of course I would. Right. So then. I didn't take him seriously because I had guys talking to me like that all the time. Not not just them, but tons of other guys. And nothing right. ever came of it. Would you right. publish a book by me? Sure, I would. And then I would never hear from him again or right. whatever. Right. 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 So it, it just sounded like hot air at that moment. Right. So, but Rob's talks got increasingly serious. And so eventually I get the fateful call, which is, I'm flying to – Rob calls up and says, I'm flying to New York on X day in whatever it was, December. We're going we're gonna to get serious about this deal. If you want to be part of it, you have to be in New York on, this, on these days. Okay. So Tom and Chris and I called the travel agent and booked the flights to New York. Wait a minute. Hang on. What's a travel agent? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I hear you, brother. <laughs> yeah, we used to we used to have a travel agent because uh, go there, ahead. There, there, there was there was no inter there was no internet services to book your own flights. That's right. And 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 people don't have any idea what it was like to call and try to book flights uh, without a travel agent back in the day. You'd want to kill yourself. The airlines were not particularly helpful with that. So no, no. Tra travel agents were almost a necessity. Yeah, because they got you the better deals, and yeah. Well, they could see all the flights. Right, exactly. You I mean, they, they, they had access to all your options, whereas if you right. try to do it yourself, you, you might be able to get one option, two options, maybe, or you had to call all the airlines yourself. Right. It was a stupid process back in the day, for sure. Boy, did we get off track. But um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, Aaron. Let's solve the airline industry's problem, shall we? That's uh, yeah. If we can't solve the comic industry. Maybe we can solve the airline industry. Um, okay, so you guys are rushing to New York, and then what happens? Uh, well, we check at our hotel. Okay, well, don't um, we, we, we okay. get we get we get a communication that says we're going to meet. We're all going to meet for breakfast. Please be there. We go to breakfast at this point. Todd has already taken over basically the conversation. Right. right. And he says to everybody sitting at breakfast, we're going to go to see Marvel. We're going to go to DC. 
We're going to tell them we're not working for them anymore. And now this is apparently some of this was news to to even Eric and um, and Rob that that oh. was you know Todd is already sort of making decisions for the group. Right, right. Just sort of say, okay, this, yeah, okay. Right. Um, and then after we talk to them, we'll all get together for dinner tonight and we'll all talk about the results, you know, sort of debrief after these meetings. Okay. So then Tom and Chris and I didn't have anything to do all day. So I think we went out and walked around Manhattan and we went to Forbidden Planet and we went and saw a movie and talked about, oh my God, I wonder what the hell's happening. And then we met at Mickey Mantle's. Uh, which is a, a rest, was a restaurant in New York. I don't know if it's still open or not. Do you remember what movie you went and saw? You'd have to ask Mason. He would know. I don't have any idea. Uh, such an important night in your life. You don't remember the movie you went and Dude, saw. Dude, the stuff I don't remember would... would <laughs> Still <laughs> volumes, right? The volumes of shit I don't remember. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm such a goldfish. I really live in the moment. <laughs> Drives my wife nuts. Oh, hey, did you do you have any snacks with you in the hotel room? Um, let's see. Yes, I do now, but I've eaten them all. Let's see. Oh. I had a bag of nacho cheese Doritos. Okay. I had a bag of sour cream and onion potato chips. Wow, so healthy stuff. I had some twisty, some twisty Fritos and some M and M's and the Butterfinger. And there's a Kit Kat waiting for me. Well, see, this is a snack centric show, so I wanted to wanted to share that information with our viewers. Yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to say I'm trying to not eat, devour the Kit Kat the way I devoured all the other snacks in a matter of minutes. I, yeah, just just okay. like just laying on the bed, shoving stuff yeah. into my mouth. It's really kind of obscene. So, from what I can gather, from what you've told me so far, you went to a movie that you can't remember, but you do remember going to Mickey Mantle's, and that's where you met the rest of the gang. Well, that's the, that's where that, that's where Todd talked about having talked to Mark Silvestri, okay. and that's where Todd said to us, "All right, you guys, we told Marvel and DC to go piss off. We're going to create this thing. Um, you're, you know, if you want to be the publishers of this thing, um, go upstairs, come up with a plan, come up with a proposal, and present it to us at breakfast the next day." And we're like. Fuck, because we, I uh, think. I, wait, what did you just say? I said fudge. I don't think that's what you said, Dave. Okay, all right. Fair hey, enough. Your story, please. Right, you're right. I'm not <laughs> getting away with that. Um, <laughs> we, we recognized how big a deal this was, and so we went upstairs, and I don't think we slept more than two and a half hours. We were up all night. Oh, I'm sure. And there were no good like portable spreadsheet programs at that point so <laughs> we're, we're you guys sitting, get your ruler out you're like trying to hotel we're in this hotel room just trying to figure out exactly what we think we can get them to agree agree to and despite the press releases that you hear from from image there were tons of creator owned imprints and creator owned comics and there was a precedent for everything that image did Every single thing except the top artists getting together, ganging up together. Right. That was the only That's difference. Right. right. Everything else had been done before, right? I mean, Mike Friedrich had done Star Reach, what, 20 years before that or something? Yeah, that's right. That's so, exactly right. Yeah. Oh, no. No, Dave. Oh my gosh, this is where the story gets cooking and this has to happen. I hope he's still not talking and and doesn't realize he bugged out on us. So let's all try and remember Dave was on the spreadsheet. I know. Well, wait a minute, let's just let's let's uh let's calmly wait for Dave's return because I am on the, I've heard this story before of course but I'm on the edge of my seat so um let's see if Dave can return to us I'll switch cameras over and, and continue drawing while we wait to see if Dave can rejoin us oh 
Let's, he'll come. He'll come back in. He'll come back in. I have. I can feel it in my bones. Oh, excuse me. So, do to do. I could finish the story for him, but I'm not going to because it's not my story to tell. Do to do. Mm -hmm. So the real question I think is what movie did Dave go see? That's kind of what I want. That's right, you guys. Everybody remember Dave was on the spreadsheet when he comes back. He's probably like banging on his computer. <laughs> you know, the 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 upside of of being able to do this kind of stuff is that you know he can be in a hotel room in St. Louis and show up on my show. The bad downside of it is the technology also has its glitches that can ruin all this stuff in a moment. Now I gotta they're calling for you, David. But the thing is, I'm saving David for tomorrow. I don't wanna I don't wanna use up all of our good stuff. Uh, No, I didn't eject him. I love Dave too much to eject him. Um, we are having storm. Oh, and we got Eric Hawkins from uh, St. Louis is here. We are having storms in the St. Louis area tonight. How about that? Let me send Dave a message here. I'm going to type in, Dave, come back to us. Dave, come back. To us. Okay. Let's see what happens. Technology is a uh, fickle mistress. You can quote that and put it on a t-shirt. Yeah, really, That's this is the truth. Jeff Potts, I ejected him for lack of snacks, and you're darn right I did. That is, the language is one thing. But if you don't come to the show prepared to eat, then why are you even on the show? Oh. Anyway, that's unfortunate. So where were we? Oh, yeah, Ms. Marvel, or Captain Marvel, excuse me. Now, I do kind of think this is kind of a cool outfit that she's got going on here. Do you guys prefer the Ms. Marvel with the high th thigh high boots, the black costume and all that kind of stuff? Or do you prefer this sort of Captain Marvel incarnation? I'm not talking about this, the most modern incarnation where she's, you know, uh, how should we say, not the most attractive female character we've ever seen. Uh, but back like this Terry Dodson, you know, when Terry was doing the covers and stuff a few years ago. Do we, do we prefer this or do we prefer Ms. Marvel? Well, see, all the, 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 everything is, uh, it's just like politics, split right down the middle. Hyper Kaiju is going Ms. Marvel 100% of the way. Paul, this one, he'd rather go this way. Higher, further, Miss War, there you go. Hey, guess who's back? Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Ulbrich has reestablished his internet and is back joining us. Can you hear me, Dave? I can hear you, but my my laptop has died, and I don't I don't know how to revive it. So I'm now I'm talking to you on my phone. Well, you know you can plug it in. That's cute. <laughs> Look, he's looking. He's going, oh, can you? You know, what's, you know what's even cuter about that? I think that's exactly what happened. <laughs> oh, look at he's got Angry Hulk was right in the screen. Angry Hulk was right there. Okay, so okay, you were so where where were we? Spreadsheet. You were working on the spreadsheet, trying to figure something out. Oh yeah. So like, basically, basically, we used a bunch of the models that we knew that Dean Mullaney had, prop, you know, pop, uh, um, started at Eclipse, and um, some of the stuff that Mike Friedrich had done with the creator own stuff, and we knew how some of those deals were structured. So we just do we just structured a deal that was pretty similar to that, right? But it was obviously a little bit better, a little more generous because we sure. wanted to, 
we we looked at each other and we sort of went anyway so we put together this deal we went down to breakfast and we never presented the we never got a chance to present the offer at all because Todd had already decided exactly what the deal was going to be and it was take it or leave it and you of course were going to take it well, we took it because our choice was either do the deal or compete with the deal. Right. And it made it just seemed to make more sense to us to do the deal. Well, that's a good that you know, that's an interesting observation, really, Dave, because if you had let them walk and they'd cut this deal with somebody else, then in order to get them, you'd have had to give them a better deal than what you were agreeing to give them at that point. Well, right, but you gotta understand Todd made a pretty out it was it was it was a reasonably outrageous deal um, right given the parameters of what creator owned comics have looked like before that right i mean certainly it, it 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 didn't have the same problems a lot of the stuff has today where the publishers wanted to take a long term interest it was you own it all you do it all we're just going to be your publisher but the money the way the money was split up from publishing um was if if they hadn't sold the just unbelievably mountainous pile of comics that they sold, it would have been a pretty bad deal for us. Right, but you guys must have had confidence that you were going to be able to sell a ton of these books, or were you just going on blind faith? You know, going God, I hope this works out. Well, it it, it kind of didn't. There was part of the, well, we we knew it was going to be pretty big. We didn't know how big. I don't think anybody knew how big. Mm -hmm. But once again, we had a choice. We could either do the deal. Or we would have to compete with the deal. Right. And so we just built in a fail safe, basically. And so we built it just to the point where we knew we couldn't um, do any worse than breaking even. Well, in that situation, you're like, as, long, as long as you're guaranteeing yourself you're not losing money, then you're betting on the fact that McFarlane and Jim Lee and these guys just sold a million copies of X-Men and, and uh, Spider-Man and that some of that's going to carry over to your books, I would assume, right? That's what you're hoping. Well, we're, yeah, we're obviously hoping that, you know, a lot of stores that maybe weren't carrying Malibu before that would start carrying them. I mean, basically, remember you and I talked about how what the upsides and downsides were of doing a licensed comics deal. Right, right. And it was it's not that much different, except we didn't have to pay them a bunch of money we just had to put in a bunch of effort and expend a bunch of money up front that was going to be coming back pretty quickly so money to diamond money to capital money to the printer that kind of stuff how uh how many books did you guys get through before they decided they yeah we'll do it ourselves we don't need you guys it was all it was almost exactly a year to the day so you so you basically got well if everybody had met their deadlines, you would have got 12 issues of everything. But Spawn was pretty regular, though, wasn't it? No. Well, well, it well, well compared all, to the other guys. Well, right. But Spawn didn't start. I think Spawn was the third book out, out of the shoot, I think. Well, that's right. Rob's was the first one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Young Blood, then Savage Dragon, and then Spawn, I believe, was the was the launch order. It meant right. It serves. And you guys did the first issue of um, Pit, right? Because I remember yep. going through the offices and you guys had orig Dale's original art sitting there in that art room. And I remember Gary Martin and I were just sitting there. Hi, Shell. Hi. Um, we're hey, just Aaron, is it okay if I still love your wife? Is that all right? That's all right. Just not physically. Um, Do okay. it emotionally from a distance. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, we're at a perfect distance for that. That's right. Okay. Hi, Shell. Hi. So you because i remember holding on to those dale keown pages and going you know if i had just an ounce less of integrity than i do i would steal these <laughs> well it's weird because there's all it was it was this weird permutation of they wanted us to be kind of a publisher and they didn't and every studio wanted to use us differently i mean it was a big mess i mean Given the parameters of the deal, we should have never seen those Dale Keown pages. They should have never been in the office. Well, because whoever, whoever, either, well, whichever studio 
was res- was responsible for publishing Pitt, whether it was Rob's studio or Jim's studio or Mark's studio or whoever, whichever one of the owners was responsible for bringing Pitt in, they should have had that artwork and been responsible for it, not us. So you're saying basically they were sort of slacking on what little obligations they had to do work and throwing it to you guys. Well, well no, it was just kind of all over the place. They, they they were inventing the wheel as they went, and we already had four wheels and an engine, and they kept inventing, you know, square wheels and octagon wheels, and like <laughs> they really didn't have any. They really didn't have any clue what they were doing. Right. Um, but they didn't need to because they were just rolling in just giant piles of cash right and when they and when they fired us they told us that um we could we could hire four monkeys to do for us what malibu does for us i remember you telling me that and i was like wow yeah, whatever and that's when they went and did their own thing even though right. you guys but, but, basically... but, right but then they started hiring their college friends and sisters and you know right. people that didn't have any clue what they were doing right and the closest the closest person that was actually professional that got hired out of that whole first two-year batch was probably Jim Lee hiring John Nee. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's funny because obviously Jim's studio survived. Wildstorm is one of the ones that survived. Yeah. And he actually was able to sell it and make some money on it. So uh, all these other guys just sort of kind of fell apart or kind of splintered and man, what I just kind of slowly dissipated in the wind you know and uh and of course todd has built his empire and is doing fine but yeah it's, um, it's, just, it's, it's a much it's, it's certainly a much different beast now than it was then and it, and it's gone through a lot of 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 um evolution over the years for sure yeah hey i gotta take one second and david williams wanted to see my finished zaytana so I think everybody wants to see that. See the crotch on that one looks fine. I don't know what you're doing with that Captain Marvel. It's just the way that the the belt sash is hanging over her. Uh, just, just, just don't pay any attention to me. So, I've been, uh, you know, I've, I've, been I've been in St. Louis. I've been in St. Louis for four days. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I I because Dave was in the chat and I like let's bring in our nighttime guest is now Dave Ulrich to talk about the good old days. And so I quit drawing and started interviewing Dave. Yeah. Well, there you have it, and I took a little power nap and dave was that dave had snacks in his room so he fits right in with the rest of us that's the theme always hey, hey, hey don't shelly don't you have a birthday coming up oh isn't that nice look at that what is well you guys all remember because it was always during san diego oh sure give away my secrets i can't oh. remember i can't well, remember anyway I can barely, I can barely, barely remember my own name. So I want to take. I want to take pride <laughs> no, it's really sweet though. I want to, I want yeah. to take pride in remembering your birthday, but when you oh, need to. Really sweet. Yeah, well, another one. Yet another one. I have some, um, I have some Bigfoot, Jack Links. Uh... <laughs> my, my, my boss was talking to somebody at the Olympic trials today, and he turned to him and he goes, "Yep, Dave's my only employee that's got his own Wikipedia page." <laughs> nice nice not bad not bad my daughter and her friends in um like grade school and junior high thought it was the coolest thing that i had a wikipedia page but they made fun of the picture they chose because for the picture they chose to put my wikipedia page has like a reflection on my glasses it makes it look like i'm wall-eyed <laughs> <laughs> like all the pictures they could have grabbed off the internet you know that's thank you very much man yeah. About a about a decade ago, I tried to create my own Wikipedia page, and I got this email from Wikipedia saying, "Oh no, I'm sorry, you don't measure up, Bell. You don't you don't meet the you don't meet the standards by which a you can you know necessary oh, for a Wikipedia page." And then, like I, two or three years ago, I discovered somebody else had put it up, and it was just there. So who knows? That, I mean, that's the thing. I tried to like correct mine, and they wouldn't take it. I'm just like. Who knows the truth about me better than I do? But apparently, you, you have to provide documentation because you could be any Yahoo. Well, who's the guy that's uh, you know? That, who's the guy that <laughs> wrote it the first place? Where's his documentation? We get this dog off me. What's my what's my beef jerky? Yeah. Oh my gosh! So should, should we talk about something your your listeners want to talk about as opposed to you and me just doing what we usually do? <laughs> Yeah, because I want to tell a story. What they really want to know is stuff about Shelly. 
Okay, what? well, I don't blame them for that. That's what I want to know. Oh, too. Lord. Uh, do you remember? Oh, gosh. You remember the, the Chinese food place where we used to go and meet every every yep. year at, at Horton Plaza? Yep. Now, you remember right now, if you're facing the Chinese restaurant, oh, there's a, there was a, on the left hand side, there was a restaurant there. It was kind of like a wine, California. Yeah, California wine and steakhouse kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We ended, now, up, we ended up in there one year when we couldn't get into the Chinese place. Right. And we went in there and we yep. had, a, I had the cake made and it was delivered to them and they had it and they brought it out after. He's licking the beef jerky off my fingers. Um, but do you remember who showed up at that? God damn. It, it was somebody cool and I, I don't remember. Dave Stevens. Oh, came, there you go. Do you remember that? Sure. Yeah. It was all the Malibu guys, uh, Scott Benefil, um, Terry yeah. Dodson and Rachel, and Dave Stevens. And yeah. I don't know who he came with, um, but that was a grand old time. And that's one of those, you know, we were all kind of like, oh, that's Dave Stevens. Sit down, Dave. You know what? D Dave was such a regular guy. I know he was. And I just, I just, I, I, I miss him. He was, he was, I mean, we didn't get to spend much time together. What, what time we did spend together was just like, you know, spare time in San Diego cons and stuff. But right. He was Same. such, just, he was just a, a regular dude. He was yeah, so, he was. And so, and so pleasant to be around and just yep. generous with his time. And yeah. Really like, nice, like, like a friendly dog that might lick your hand. Um, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't want Dave that. licking your hand because God yeah, knows where else he'd been licking. But other than that. Well, I sat next to him several years. Terry and I had our uh, booth um, sitting right next to Dave Stevens while he was still there, you know, and at his Bulldog Studios thing. And yep. I would talk to him all the time. And he was just, you know, he yeah. wouldn't he wouldn't just like, hey, you. It was like, hey, Aaron, how's it going? I mean, you know what I mean? It was like he, yeah, was, he, was, he was super he down to earth and he remembered everybody's name. And, yeah, he was a great guy. Um, and uh, He loves I, that beef jerky, man. I remember talking to him at a, and he actually remembered me, unlike Bernie Wrightson. He remembered me when he saw me, and um, I saw him at a Portland show. And I guess this is another story I have of me pissing off a creator, but uh, I had another one. I never intend to do it, Dave, but I always seem to do it because I, I went up to him, we were talking, and this was like, I don't know, 91 ish. Because I think the, uh, the Rocketeer movie was just coming out, or. And it was in a show that Dark Horse was putting on there in Portland. Yep. And um, we were talking about different things and blah, blah, blah. And I said, so when are we going to see some more Rocketeer? <laughs> that was a, that's an innocent question, isn't it? But, oh, he was like, he got kind of uppity with me. Dude, he was like, dude, read the room. What's wrong with I you? I know. But it was, you know, cause the movie was coming <laughs> out. And I was like... <laughs> Perfect time to ask him when we're going to see some more Rocketeer, and boy, that didn't go over well. So I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, you know, to imply that you're not doing anything." Oh my goodness! But, so one, uh, of, what, one of the linchpin creators that nobody knows about that worked at Malibu was Chris Alms' high school best friend, a guy named Paul O'Connor, and he is married to a lovely woman named Rita. And it turns out Rita was one of Dave's early models. How really? Cool that? that is what oh. you call the old small world kind of uh, yeah. thing. So, so yeah. So, and Paul O'Connor shows up on uh, Geek View Tavern all the time. He's really good on there. Um, as so good as me? Well, you haven't appeared yet, but you, you will be. Oh, you'll, you will you'll have your chance to be as good as Paul O'Connor. <laughs> we'll see. We'll hold out judgment on that one. Oh After all gosh. I've done for you, Dave, this is the this is the thanks I get. I tell you, I would ha I'd have you on Geek View Tavern every time, except you've got a competing channel. What am I going to do? I know it's like we can't we can't cross. Someone put in earlier, yeah, never cross, don't, don't cross the street. Right. Um, somebody had a question for you. What they always ask me editorial stuff, and I almost never ended. I almost never. No, it was something about whether or not you knew somebody or had ever dealt with somebody. Um, Which one why are you in? Uh, let's see. It was just after you bleeped out on us. Um. Oh, I don't know. If you want to ask. That's a great shot, Dave. Thank you. 
There he is. And here's my ceiling. And uh, what do you think of that? You, you, you know what's hundred percent right though? It was my it was it was my laptop running out of juice that cut us off. Yeah, so you're yes. exactly right. I gave him a pretend about not plugging it in. And oh. he's like, I, 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 I thought I thought it was I thought it was plugged in, and then after you said that, I looked. I go, oh look, it's not actually plugged in. I bet it's dead. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that big dummy. <laughs> okay, uh, getting back on track. Oh. So you guys made. Mm, relatively, you made a buttload of money in that one year that you were uh, handling the image books. Yep, yep, yep. And so then you guys decided at that point, hey, they ditched us, but we've now we've got some steam. We're going to launch our own comic line. So well, talk we, about about, about <laughs> just about the time that we got Spawn number one out the door. We had already, Chris was already starting to work on his initial proposal for the Ultraverse. Really? Okay. Because it was, the, the writing was just on the wall. Those guys didn't want to have anything to do with us. No matter how hard we worked for them, um, they didn't want us to get any credit for anything that they did. And they didn't want us to even get credit for what we did. So um, the writing was pretty much on the wall that, that the relationship was going to end sooner rather than later. So that's we interesting. Went, that we wanted, part. We wanted to land. We wanted to last as long as possible, obviously, because we were, you know, everybody was doing so well. But um, we had already start. We already started making contingency plans. Yeah. Okay. Here's the question I was looking for. Did Dave ever deal with Andrew Rev? I don't know who that is. That sounds vaguely familiar to me. Andrew, uh, Rev. I, I, I probably met Andrew Rev a couple of times. Um. Um, I can, I think I can honestly say without causing too much trouble, I don't have any respect for Andrew Rev. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. What did, what did he do? What was his? <sighs> See, well, I think he's the guy that currently owns Youngblood of all things. Of all oh, things. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Okay. But no, he was also the guy that I believe bought Kamiko maybe out of bankruptcy. I'd, I'd have to look. I'd have to look up. He's got a very checkered past, but he's got very questionable um, business tactics, business mm -hmm. ethics. I don't know how you want to put it. Um, well, it's interesting you said checkered past because Kamiko has a checkered logo. So yeah, that's not even close to funny. But it was a nice try. <laughs> no, no, Dave thinks this is what Dave's doing here. <gasps> It was yeah. weak. It yeah. was weak loss. I, yeah. I guarantee it, yeah. but I couldn't yeah. pass it up. Okay, so here so, I'm going to so, so, so I, I've met Andrew Rev. I don't respect Andrew Rev. I think I, I think Andrew Rev is a blight on the business. Um, so there you go. But other than that, as far as you know, he's a great guy. So what about this, Dave? Did uh, Do you have a favorite Malibu title, or did you have one that was your favorite? Besides Sludge? No. Be honest. <laughs> Be honest. From, I got different ones from different eras. Like I really always liked Tommy's Dinosaurs for Hire. I thought that was mm -hmm. terrific. Um, you know, saying that you like the trouble with girls has caught is troublesome. Um, <laughs> despite the fact that I liked it, it had like four publishers. Um, on the Ultraverse side, I like I really liked reading Firearm, although the art was always harder to take than some of the other books because we couldn't keep anybody good on it. Um, was, Cully, was Cully on that for a while? Cully started it, and then he went off to do other things or or couldn't keep up with the schedule or something. Yeah, no, I I, I we really liked Cully on the book for sure, and he did some of the seminal work at the beginning, but um, then we ended up with a sort of a hodgepodge and. I mean, we we tried really hard to keep guys on the books. Firearm was always a good read. Um, Sludge never suffered in the art department. It always had trouble because Steve couldn't turn in his work. Yeah, and I don't, know, any, I don't know if anybody's I don't know if anybody's listening to this has heard the story, but Steve was so um, desperate for money and was so had so much trouble turning in his work that there was a period of about two or three months. Where he was basically punching in at Malibu, and he'd turn in his pages at the end of the day, and we'd give him a check based on the number of pages he wrote while he sat in, while he sat in our office. Yeah, 
I think Mason or I don't know, maybe it was Danko was telling me that, yeah, we, we had or maybe it was all. I don't remember which one of you guys, but was saying that, yeah, we, we, we had him come in and we made him sit down and go, you know, and he wanted money for groceries. Finish your damn script and then we'll give you the money for groceries on your way out the door. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't much different than that. It was. But, you know, having said all that, I Steve's one of my favorite people I've ever met. So. Oh, and he did his writing on that book was just next level. It was so good when he actually did some writing on it. Right. Yeah. Um, when he actually turned stuff in. Yeah. Okay. Now I have an, this is, this is something I've been wondering for years. I don't know why I've never asked you this before, but it just kind of came into my mind. I had just, when I met you and Tom, you guys approached me at Atlanta at Dragon Con. If you remember, yep. right? I was sitting next to Bagley. Yep. And, um, he was, you know, we were both signing Spider-Man 365 because I had done the backup origin story in there. And he, of course, did the main story because he was yep. a Spider-Man artist. And you guys came up to me and talked to me about, you know, doing some work for Malibu. But then you also said, we've got something bigger planned down the road, you know. And, you know, I, you know, I thought I was, you know on my way at Marvel, but I was still entertained, you know, entertained by the idea that, you know, what you said beyond what your books were. Because so I think I said I didn't really have any interest in working on what you guys were publishing, but you were like, well, we got something cooking that you might be interested in. And I said, well, you know, certainly keep me in the loop. And of course you did. And of course the rest is history. But my question to you is, how in the world did you guys even know who I was that you would come up and ask me to work on the book? In, in Atlanta? You know? Yeah, do you remember? Did you see me sit next to Bagley and go, hey, let's see if we can get that guy? Or did you actually? No, we didn't know who you were. We had no oh. idea who you were. Okay. We, we, we were from, we, I, I was at my, see, this is the problem, my best recollection. But um, no, I saw the quality of the work that you had laying on your table. I see. Okay. And I, you know, I saw some of the pages I knew had been published. So I knew that you were getting marvel you know some marvel work but i saw mm -hmm. the quality of your work and i listened carefully to the way you talked about your work and that's what impressed me the most i see okay because i was because i hadn't done anything at that point and i was like i'm trying to remember because i mean my gosh that was what 30 years ago or whatever it was but i'm trying to i remember that day but i can't remember the details i was like why did these guys even come up and talk to me? I was like a complete nobody, and then I ended up because we, we were we were we were scouring every artist alley we could find to to right. find the appropriate talent to put with the the books for the Ultraverse. Right, because I did. You guys threw a couple of dinosaur for <laughs> things at me, cover wise. I didn't do any interiors because I don't think you guys were able to pay enough for what I was getting at Marvel, even though I wasn't getting that much at the time. It was still. You know, I think it was like 85 bucks was my page rate or something. Yeah, well, we were, we were really careful not to overpromise. I mean, that was that right. was the linchpin of Malibu is like, look, we know what these books are going to sell. We know what that's going to throw off in terms of an allowable amount of money we can pay them talent. And we don't want to get in the position where we're start to overpromise because then if we can't deliver, we look like Andrew Rev. So. <laughs> 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 we, 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 we wanted to make sure that if I, pro, if, you know what I'm saying, Aaron, if I promised yes. you $50 a page, I wanted to make sure that I delivered $50 a page and I delivered it when I said I was going to and right. not promise you 85 and then not pay it for a year. Right, right. No, I mean, I, you guys, that's one thing I've always admired about, about you, Dave, is your level of integrity. And I, I, and, you know, there's certain people you, you get in working relations with ship with over the years, and you don't necessarily trust them or maybe even like them that much, but they're, you know, they're, you're offering you the um, job. Right. Right. Anyways, a, a means to an end. Yeah. Oh, right. But, but it, it was your, your level of integrity that has kept us friends. That there's someone I wanted to be friends with after Malibu went under and we, you know, we've been friends, you know, obviously for uh, a yeah. decade now. A long, long damn time. Well, basically, basically, I had we, hair we, and you we, weren't great. Yeah. So we, we we started being friendly at Atlanta, and I don't think we've never been fr not friendly since then. Oh, that's frankly. right. Now here's a, this says this starts. This question is bad because it starts with "Do you remember?" <laughs> yeah, so, that's a problem. Uh, but go ahead. Do you remember John Dennis, the penciler whom Steve Englehart tried to get for Strange, and then later was on Nightman? Curious if you remember his work. Just, John Dennis, just just, just vaguely. Um, I I thought. Dennis's work um, had some real fundamental strengths, but I think it also had, I mean, my memory as a, 
of it, of it, what little memory I have of it was that it also had some, some fundamental weaknesses. And I thought we could probably, um, find someone better for, um, the books that he was working on. But I, other than that, I don't remember, um, John that well, um, I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. Um, I couldn't art spot his work i couldn't tell you that much about his work um but i remember thinking he was almost there like three quarters of the way there halfway there something like that um, I, think, I think i saw him having dinner with andrew rev at the last san diego i'm not certain about that so I, I, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy yeah don't 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 yeah don't do that you know the, i wish i wish malibu had obviously we all wish that malibu had lasted longer but that was to me, you know, we, I was when I was interviewing Walter and Wheezy this morning or earlier this afternoon. Um, you know, we had we talked briefly about how they, you know, were they knew Wrightson and Chaikin and Al Milgram and all these guys, Starlin at the very early. You know, they were all very very young in their careers, and how Walter had made the comment that even then he kind of sort of you know had an out of body experience where he could kind of look at the situation and go, wow, I'm right in the middle of the good old days. You know, like somehow this was, this was going to be meaningful stuff, you know, decades down the road, I'm going to look back on this and, you know, realize how cool this was. And that I had some of those moments at Malibu because I remember being on buses and I, this, I don't know where we were getting bussed around, but I think early you, on, you, you were being bussed from the West Bank in to Universal Studios for our big Universal Studios party. That's right. And, um, but we were oftentimes, we would, we would go to shows and you got, you would have us all there, right? Yep. And it was probably like shuttle bus stuff from the hotel and things. But, cause this was after I met, the first time I met Chaikin was at a Motor City Con and somebody introduced him to me, or he, he introduced me to him, or however you, you know, however yeah. Howard remember it, right? And uh, I remember him saying, "Oh, you're the guy that draws sludge. Your stuff, that your that stuff doesn't suck." And I was like, you know, coming from Howard Shake, and I'll take that as a compliment. So, but I have this memory of having this conversation with him and Englehart, and I used to hang out quite a bit with Englehart during the, the Malibu days for some reason, and. Um, but I remember we were sitting and talking on the bus and, and Howard knew who I was. So this had to have been after the Motor City thing. Um, so I don't know if we were at just at another con that we were all going to or something. I don't know. But I remember Englehart, Englehart and, I, and I usually would sit around those guys because I was the young guy just breaking into the industry. And I would sit around those guys and just listen to their stories and stuff and talk about how they would, you know, go to WonderCon back in the old days and get high and sit up on the balcony and, you know, and whatever. Sure. Um, but... I remember Englehart talking to Chaikin because Chaikin had developed firearm for you, but he wasn't really working for Ultraverse in well, regular. He, 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 I think he did the original character designs and then he did a, right. a few of the covers. Yeah. Right. So he wasn't, so he wasn't part of the Malibu thing, but he was there. And so we were on this bus and I was sitting next to Englehart talking and then Englehart was talking and basically about his work on strangers. Right, and they were right. talking about some stories and stuff. But Englehart says, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, so this is an exact quote. But the idea was, he goes, uh, he basically asked Chaikin if he had read the, the Stranger stuff because oh, he's talking. No. About oh no! Why and, would he do? Why would he do that? You know, Chaikin goes, no. You know, he's like, Steve, I can't read everything. I'm busy. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. The other thing. And Englehart looks at him with all these kind of like these puppy dog eyes and goes, Well, I read everything you do. <laughs> Oh my God! And had this moment, he just goes, "All right, Steve, I'll read it, okay?" And um, <laughs> I just, you know, I'm just kind of there was moments like that that I was just taking all this in, you know, and listening sure. to this guy talk oh, that's, about that's a really you know, funny story. The good old days in the Wonder Con, you know, where they're getting wasted and dropping acid or whatever they were doing, you know, at the show. Yeah. And just it was just amazing, and 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 Chaykin, Chaykin was interesting because we he sort of became. He sort of became, I was Luke Skywalker and he was Darth Vader. And we had sort of had this, this kind of relationship and it was really, it was really entertaining. And uh, for both of us, I think. And um, the problem is that to me, 
like Jake is an intellectual because I'm a Philistine for sure. Right. Like I'm like I'm a hundred percent Philistine and and Howard still likes me, so I guess that's a good thing. Well, I don't know if I ever told you this story, but it's one of my favorite stories. I've told it a hundred times because it's such a great story. We were sitting in the back of a cab or a chartered ride, whatever you want to call it, in Germany. Because I was there for uh, we were fortunate enough to I was part of um I did a couple issues of detective that got collected in this bigger volume. Of his, oh, thank you. So he's bringing me ice bags. It's so freaking hot up here. Yeah. Whoo, it's chilly, but it cools me off. Um, so we're sitting in the back of this cab, just him and me, right? And he's, you know, he's, he's being Howard. He's talking about um, just a bunch of philosophers and, you know, crap. <laughs> and yeah. Dropping names. Oh, you know, I read Nietzsche or whatever, you know, and he's just blah, blah, blah. And I look at him and I go, because I have such, I love Howard, but I have such disdain for him at the same time that we that I just am very frank with him. You know, I'm not intimidated by him at all. I, I welcome his abuse, kind of. And so I just look at him and I say, I go, Howard, what makes you think that I have any idea what you're talking about or even care? <laughs> and there was silence for a second, right? And he looks at me and he goes, he goes Aaron, he goes, you know what you are? He goes, you're a, you goes, you're you're an anti-intellectual. Um, oh my gosh, oh, what did he an say? Anti-intellectual. Um, um, sn uh, snob. He goes. You're an anti-intellectual snob. And he goes. And you're proud of it. And I, I thought for a second, and I go, Howard, who's the best, that's the most apt description of me that anyone has ever given. So, and we just thank kind of, you. we and thank you, and we just started laughing because it was so funny, but it was so true. I am. I'm anti-intellectual. And I'm snobbish about it. I hate intellectuals. And right. so, because <laughs> they're so pretentious. But but Howard is an intellectual and, uh, or fancies himself an intellectual. Um, but he's way, and, he's way smarter than me. That's yeah, he's way better read than I'll ever be. And, and yeah. it just it just cracked me up. And it was so, and I think it sort of took him back a little bit because he was like, I just said this to him and he's not even offended by it. <laughs> and I'm like, Howard's a, that's the best thing about Howard. He's a grown up. He's, I mean, he's yeah. a child, but he's a grown up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he conducts himself like a man. He's a good guy. I like him. I like him yeah, a lot. So I, I, I do too. I, I, I get a kick out of him. And, uh, um, but, yeah, we used to call him Swear and Howard. Um, but he, uh, <laughs> why would that be? I can't imagine. I can't imagine. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, we always, you know, He's gotten a lot mellower. We don't jab each other like we used to when he was, you know. I, 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 was I, we, we just recently canceled a lunch date because he got into a, some sort of low-level car accident. So he couldn't get oh, really? for a couple of days, yeah. But, yeah. Everyone, so we'll, everyone, we'll, we'll schedule something when I get back from St. Louis, I guess. Hey, I, everyone, got, a I got a question yeah. for you. Like, Go you, ahead. Like, in the early days, you and Terry were pretty tight. I mean, probably are still pretty tight, right? You yeah. and Terry Dodson, yeah. yeah. Um, how, how did he end up under Steve Donnelly's wing and you didn't? I think. Was he, was Terry just insecure enough or wanted somebody else to deal with the money stuff? Cause I can't imagine you letting anybody else deal with the money stuff. Terry, Terry doesn't like to be hassled, you know, and I, I don't like to let go of and I am such a control freak. I don't yeah. want anybody messing with my stuff. Sure. You know, I have constantly would have not now, but you know, back when I was working on Wonder Woman or back when I was, you know, uh, doing high profile stuff, I'd have art agents come up to me all the time. They're like, dude, I can get twice as much money for those pages as you're getting. And I would be like completely unimpressed by it. Cause I was like, yeah, I, I just prefer to handle this myself. Cause sure. I'm just that way. And Terry's not that way at all. If you can get, someone else to, you know, handle that stuff so he doesn't have to worry about it, that he can just focus on whatever it is that he wants to do, whether that's drawing right, or... The, the, funny, the funny thing to me about what you just said is you and Terry are, are the opposite sides of the same coin. Like, you both, the goal for both of you is to not be hassled, but you right. want to be hassled by controlling everything, and Terry right. wants to be not hassled by not controlling anything. Right, Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's funny. He's he's probably the most laid back dude I've ever met in my life. He just he's just even keel and does what it takes to get it done. And 
doesn't want to deal with the hassle. And so he gets people around him that can deal with the hassle. Um, uh, and, uh, but Donnelly never really approached me anyway. You know, okay. I think Terry had a, um, I mean, let's face it. Terry has more of a, um, likable style, more of an appeal to uh, stylistically than I do. Um, that is maybe touches a broader range of fandom than my st style does. And uh, Dave's doesn't necessarily agree with that. That's okay. No, I, 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 don't, I don't, I don't agree with that only be it, but I, I hear what you're saying in that Terry draws in a tradition or in a, with influences that sort of started at Adam Hughes and, and it's the same branch of comic art that gave birth to Frank Cho. Um, yeah, and he has, a, he has a lot of animation influence in his work as well, Terry does. Yeah. And those are sort of, that's more of a contemporary sort of direction to go. And I don't, and you know, I love Terry's stuff. And I get I get the appeal to his stuff. Yeah, my stuff is more traditional, you know. And and I got to a point. I'm not going to say you know one style is better than another style. And it's just it's you know people respond. I mean that's how you judge, who, right? Who, but who 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 else's artwork do you see in your work? In the, in other words, like early Terry definitely has heavy notations from Adam Hughes or, or they're both pulling from the same source material. One of the right. two. Right. And, and um, so where, what branch of the development tree has led to your style? Do you think? Well, my, I grew up, they're going to take a short story and turn it into a long one, but <laughs> <laughs> what we do. that's what we do. I, I got, you know, I just got two more hours to fill Dave. I got to be, you know, um, so my mom was always on my case about not copying other people. Right. Not the best advice, by the way, just saying. No, it isn't. But, um, so I, growing up, I was a big, because I grew up in the seventies, right. Yeah. You and I are roughly the same age, right? So the yeah. stuff that, that I was really interested in, and Terry grew up in the 80s, and those are two completely different decades of comics and comic yeah. influences, right? So I was looking at Barry Smith, Bernie Wrightson, uh, Plug, uh, guys that were illustrators of comics, and, and Frazetta, of course, and guys who were Ill they were doing portfolios. They were, they were basically trying to take comic art and turn it into fine art, right? But at the same time as I was being influenced by those guys, I was looking at the superhero comics like Buscema and Romita and sure. what you would consider traditional comics, okay? So there wasn't any guys other than maybe, you know, Simonson that was kind of doing some different stuff in comics and Starlin, I guess, maybe a little bit as well, even though you could still argue that even though he had a specific look to his stuff, it was very, it fit within what people expected comics to look like, right? Um, and so that those were my influences, right? So draw it well, draw it so that it looks, you know, I mean, realism is not really the right word to use, but- No, but I, I understand, I understand what you mean, but yeah, realism is not the right word, but I understand what you mean. And Terry came in when stylization was much more a thing with Golden and Arthur Adams, and then of course, St Simonson really hitting his stride in the 80s. Um, and so he, and you know, he had those type of influences, Dave Stevens, Rocketeer, um, yeah. you know, where guys were kind of really broke away from, I mean, Wrightson and Smith, and those guys broke away, but they didn't really stay in comics that long. Right. It's, just, it's the same Terry, to my eye, Terry pulled from the same sources for his inspiration that Stuart Inman did. I mean, they ended up in slightly different places, and I can tell their yeah. artwork apart, but right. that's art that's related for sure. Yeah, and and I was, you know, I'm eight years older than Terry, so I was the decade before him, although we broke in at about the same time, because I went to film school and I was pursuing other things and, and kind of came full circle back around to art about the same time he was breaking in. Yeah. So here you have a guy breaking in 
with a more of a 70s influence style me and Terry with more of a contemporary influence style. And so obviously he was going to have better success than I was because he was working in a style that was more acceptable at that period of time. If we had been broke, if we both broke in in 1975, it might have actually flipped, you know, probably not because he's very talented, but I would have, my work would have been viewed very, very differently if I was drawing what I'm drawing right now back in 1975, as opposed to 1995, right? Yeah. So, but to answer your question, like I said, I told you I was going to make this long, but <laughs> Wrightson and Frazetta were my two biggest influences. Okay. okay. And when I turned 18, I got to a point where I realized that my stuff was looking too rights in I was like, I didn't want to be a copycat of rights. And that's where all this kind of stuff where my mom, you know, don't copy these other people, be your own artist, whatever. And <laughs> whereas you see most people that are successful, they started out copy. They were clones of yeah, some of artists that they loved. And then they sort of branched off. You know, Travis Shray was a Jim Lee clone. You know, Terry drew a lot of influences from Adam and then went his own direction. Uh, Kelly Jones was heavy rights and golden influences. Well, even 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 a guy you and I both worship, Mike Plug, is just it's yeah. just, it's just, it's just it's just Eisner. Yeah, yeah, and so, but and so, right when I was in a developmental stage that I really should have been aping rights and even more, I was <laughs> and trying to do my own thing. And there's nothing more troublesome and handicapping than trying to create an art style without any influences. Hey, you know, you know, you know who you remind me of in a weird way, and I mean this is a compliment. So I hope you don't hate. I hope you. I hope you like his work. Um, don't it's, it's, it's Frank Bruner. Mm -hmm. I think there's I, a lot. Of, I think there's a lot of Bruner in your work. Yeah. Or, or, or like I said, when I say that, I mean either you're looking at Bruner and pulling some influences, or both you and Bruner were influenced by the same source material. Well, again, Bruner was a guy I was looking at when I was a kid growing up. I, he, they had that sort of illustrative style, right? That was really cool. Him, yeah. Rackman, um, Barry Smith, uh, you know, um, they had that really sort of lush, sort of illustrative, brushy kind of style that, that sort of sucked me in. And, and, of course, fell out of fashion pretty quickly into the 80s. And, um, but when I draw monster stuff, like you look at my Garbage Man stuff or you look at my Sludge stuff, you see rights and all over the place. Yeah. But when I don't do monsters, you, it, it's it's completely invisible. You can see Neil Adams' influences in my layouts and stuff sometimes. And some of the, excuse me, some of the angles I choose to draw from. Yeah. You can look at it and go, that's a Neil Adams, you know, shot right there. Right, sure. And that's how stuff kind of creeps up into my work. It's not so much that I draw like any particular person but you can see those little nuggets of influence in, in the way I do things in different, yeah. different ways. So um, I still, when everybody asks me, you know, who are your influences? I generally say whoever's good, you know, because we're always looking at somebody. And I mean, I love Dale Keown stuff and I'm sure I stole some stuff from Keown. I stole some stuff from Kevin Nolan, Boland. I was on a Boland kick for a while. Oh my God. Go. Well, don't go on a Boland kick. You'll never get anything done. Yeah, I know. Um, but, 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 well, who is who? Oh, Kevin Nolan. God, I never met Kevin Nolan until three years ago. Great and I, job. And I, I started out like one of my first jobs in comics was like mailing back artwork that um, the Comics Journal was using. And Kevin was a big, um, you know, guy that did a lot of work for Gary and Kim, like spot illos and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Tim was used to do spot illustrations for the Comics Journal. I got to return his artwork and. Then he ended up doing a whole crap load of coloring for Malibu early in in in, in you know early in the Ma in the early Malibu days. Tom would send Bruce these big piles of stuff, and then he would do it whenever he had time away from his day job. Right. No, I um I I I I sought out a lot of these guys when I broke into comics to befriend them because they were guys I admired when I was younger. Sure. From Bruce and too. I I don't think I've ever met Frank Bruner, but um. Uh, you know, I've met Neil Adams. I got Neil. Neil lectured me on charging for my autograph one time uh, at Boston. <laughs> the, the, yeah, you don't want you, you don't want to know my feelings on on um, on Neil Adams. Well, I just I kept saying that as he was talking to me, I kept going, Neil, I'm not you. I'm not you. <laughs> I was going to pay me fifty bucks for my autograph. I'm not you. And uh, but anyway, it was it was funny, and um, uh, and so I spent less time. 
and again, because I am, you know, like I said, Terry and I are friends because we work together. We're in the same area. Yeah, you're uh, in the studio uh, together, right? We're in the studio together, and um, but you spent long but, you spent long days not drawing pages at the same time. That kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I'm eight years older than he is, right? I'm not of the same generation right, of sure. artists. Yeah, he is, even though I, 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 didn't, I didn't even know that. The, I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of exactly what that difference was. Yeah, so, you know, so I was not, you know, and I was not budding around with J. Scott Campbell and guys like that that Terry was. I was budding around with Mike Pluke and right. Walter Simonson and, you know. So I'm kind of a man out of time, Dave. Not that I've run out of time. But I'm not <laughs> no, apparently, apparently you've got nothing but time. We're just, yeah. we're just, we're just wasting time away right here. Hey, are, right. We, are we boring your poor audience to death at this point? I, I'm just getting Z's. No, people... <laughs> You guys love this, don't you? They love stories. Everybody wants to know this stuff. Um, oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Look at this. Yes, what? we do know your feelings on Neil Adams. They're trying to goad you, Dave, into saying something that uh, might get you in trouble. Uh, oh, it, it's entirely personal. I mean, I, I respect Neil as an artist, I, his achievements and his stance on creator rights and all that stuff. Almost unimpeachable, but he did something to me personally that was hard to forgive well that's that stuff happens so, and then so that's that all. I mean, it's, it, it's just business he conducted himself badly in my presence and at my expense so <clears throat> i have a few of those stories too but i'm not going to i'm not going to name drop um have you read howard's hey kids comics if yes how much shake and rage if any is affecting the narrative presented I haven't read it yet, so Dave, why don't you, you probably have though, right? I, I haven't read it all. I'm only two or three issues in, so I'm not even I'm not even caught up, and I found it hard to follow as a narrative because I have a hard time distinguishing the characters. I don't think they're some of them are distinct or some of them show up so infrequently. It's hard when they re show up. It's hard to tell if that's the same character or not. So well. Is it a um, sorry? But, ha but, ha but having said, but having said that, I think what Howard's doing with Hey Kids Comics is more out of love than actual rage. I think it's, I think it's the kind of affection um, that guys like you and me have for Cole Shack. <laughs> I had affection for Cole Shack until I actually went back and watched the episodes and found out no, how boring. But, but, you, but do you do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So that, well, that's it's a history of comics kind of thing, so isn't I it? I can I can say bad stuff about Kolchak all day long, but it's not it's not actually based in rage, it's right? Based, right. It's 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 based in affection, right? Right. You know, I I, okay. I I love the girl from Uncle. I love the I love the Wild Wild West, but some of that stuff, as as a grown up, not not just as a grown up, but as a twenty first century grown up. Are we in the twenty first century? Yes, I believe so. All right. Anyway, but we'll take it first. As, 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 as a modern consumer of TV, yes, it's hard to watch some of that stuff without going, "What the heck?" <laughs> so, really but, but 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 it's but it's all based in affection. It's not based in rage. So I right. think that's I think that's where Howard's, I think that's where Howard's um, heart is at with Hey Kids Comics. And and be, because Howard has an affection for ne'er do wells the same way that he has affection for scoundrels, mm -hmm. so that's I think the way the where people misunderstand some of this stuff in terms of Howard's intent. But I'm just guessing. I I have no more idea what's actually in Howard's heart than anybody else does. Well, I haven't read it yet, and it's that's that's not a slight on Howard or anything. I because I am sort of curious about it. Um, but as I confessed to Walter Simonson this morning when I was talking to him was that I just read Manhunter for the first time like a month ago. Oh my goodness. I know. And that was like his, you know, his yeah. big break into comics. And I've been aware of it my entire career or even before I got into, uh, comics, but I never saw it or read it. And then I got a collected edition of it from, uh, DC and I was like, I'm going to read this. <clears throat> and it's really pretty good. Did it, did you ever meet or have any interaction with Archie Goodwin? I have an Archie story. It's not a great story, unfortunately. Um, 
I have I probably have the biggest collection, Dave, of stories that don't end with anything spectacular happening. And it's kind of <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But Archie came to um, Portland to appear at a comic shop, which was called um, uh, Future Dreams, owned by uh, Don Reardon, and I believe it's still over there on Burnside. I haven't seen him in years. I should go in there, but um, he uh, he had him at his store, right? And that was one of the comic shops because there was no. I was on the west side of the river in Portland. And all everything comic shop wise was all on the east side, right? There wasn't anything on the west side. There was all right. just Suburbiaville over on the west side. And <clears throat> so I believe I was 18, maybe 17 or 18, right? And because I wasn't in college yet. And I I had of course convinced myself that I was a genius, right? And I have that, no I have no trouble believing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave, wow. you jerk. No, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> so I, I I knew he was coming, right? Because I, I saw the ads and they had the yep. flyer up that, you know. And yep. so I, I said, well, I'm going to do some samples, right? And sure. show them to That's a good point. And I was, I was convinced. I remember saying this to my mom. I was like, I'm going to go down there and show him these samples. And he's going to hire me. And I'm going to have to go to, I go, am I ready to go to New York at 18 years old or whatever? I mean, this is, it was all going through my head, right? You create this entire scenario sure. of how this is going to go, right? Yeah. Now, were you a, uh, I'm, I'm going to sidetrack for a second. Were you a concrete fan at all? Paul Chadwick's concrete? Um, no, actually, I don't, I don't think I've read ever. I don't think I've read more than two or three issues. I know, it, I know it's terrific and I like Paul quite a bit, but I didn't read the book very much. Okay, well, I, I read a couple as all myself, but one of the stories was Concrete is out in a <clears throat> desert contemplating life or whatever he would do, right? And he yep. sees this guy drive up in a car, right? And he's looking around, the guy's looking around, and they're in the middle of nowhere, right? The concrete's kind of up on this little rocky hill overlooking the scene. The guy opens up the trunk, takes out this bag that's pretty much body sized, right? And he takes it and digs a hole, buries the bag, and then drives off. Okay. You know? So and then so then there's a point to this story and to my story. So concrete then starts imagining what the heck's going on. Oh my gosh, this guy killed his wife and he creates this entire scenario, right? right. This sure. guy murdered his wife. And then he's the only witness to it, right? So now he's going through it and he's at he's at the trial. And he's the witness at the trial, and he gets this guy convicted, and he gets a hero, and it's and he's a hero, and he gets this parade <laughs> and all this kind of stuff, right? And so that's, he finds that's, that's that's a really clever story idea, like right? That. And then he goes down there, and he goes, "Well, I, I've got to go see what it is." And he digs it up, and it's a bag full of candy. So this guy was like, you know, getting rid of all of his, his sugar habits, and oh, that's so funny. he created this entire scenario, right, out of absolutely right, sure. nothing. Yeah. And so I convinced myself that I'm going to go meet Archie Goodwin. I'm going to show him these samples. And he's going to say, hey, would you like to come to work for Marvel, right? Yep. And so I get down there. I wait in line. You know, there's a line there to meet Archie Goodwin. And I get in and say hello. And I say, you know, would you – could I show you my portfolio? And he's like, well, yeah, sure, I guess, you know. Because he wasn't really there to look at portfolios. He wasn't on a talent search, right? And so he looks at the stuff. And then he goes, oh, well, it looks pretty good to me. He goes, I, I, I don't know what you want me to do, though, because I, you know, I'm not really, I'm not talent hunting for Marvel or anything. So I'm not the guy. He goes, what you should do is, you know, mail in your samples to the talent coordinator and all this kind of crap, you know, and that was it. And I was just, I walked away dejected and humiliated, like, I'm not going to New York anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that, that's it. That's, that was my, that's the only time I ever met Archie. But I hear he's a wonderful guy. I mean, really a wonderful guy. Well, somehow Archie found out that I was into professional wrestling. Oh, really? Yeah. And this was before the internet when in order to be in, to, to know the inside news, because like professional wrestling is all about maintaining the illusion of reality, right? I mean, that's, right. The, whole, that's the whole basis. That's the whole, re that's the whole way they sell tickets, right? So 
the only way to get information about what was really going on behind the scenes was what they used to call these. They used to call them dirt sheets, but they're basically they, were, they basically were newsletters, and you could subscribe, and then they would send them to you in the mail. And so I became a subscriber to to, to two of them, but I was reading them just you know, you know from every every single word that would come in, I would read every single word. <laughs> And then I met, Arch, I met Archie and I found out that he was into pro wrestling or he found out I was into pro wrestling. So I brought him one of these newsletters and I remember I gave him one at a convention and he came back the next day and he'd read the whole thing and he goes, where can I get more of those? <laughs> <laughs> so, so every time I would go to a convention where I knew Archie was, I would bring a small supply of them. And I'd walk up to the table and he would grab them from me and immediately stuff them in his bag so nobody saw that he had them. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. So that was the, that was the basis of my friendship with Archie Goodwin when we bonded over wrestling. But you know who else is a, you know who else is a big pro wrestling fan is uh, Stephen Grant. I was going to say, you know what, that doesn't surprise me. Now, I have not talked to Stephen Grant in ages. I mean, I don't think I've talked to him since Malibu or shortly after that. Yeah. And Grant's, Grant's, a, Grant's an odd guy. I like him a lot, and he likes me, but it's he's he's a very he's a very acquired taste for sure. Do you stay in touch with him at all? Just on Facebook, but yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Well, so. I saw your guys' show, Dave. Plug your plug your show to our uh, our viewership here. Okay, I have a little. I have I have a I have a YouTube show called Geek View Tavern, and we cover a wide variety of subjects. And it's just me and Tom Mason and whoever else we gather together to have our little discussions. And it's really fun. It's designed to be lighthearted. It's designed to be an affectionate take on all the stuff that we love and all the stuff that we hope our viewers will love. And we just have it. We just have a good time. And so there's, there's 12 of them that are up already. Um, and I'm in the, I, I should be sitting here editing the 13th one while I'm here in St. Louis, but I'm here talking to you and Aaron. So please go onto your YouTube machine, type in the words geek view tavern and pick an episode that looks interesting to you. That's right. Like anyway, you, you, you watched one. Which one did you watch? All right. And the reason I bring this up is because I think you guys, not that you missed the mark on something, but I think you missed a detail. You guys were talking about the... Um, well, we, miss de we miss details all the time. We miss big chunks of stuff all the time. You had You were talking about the possibilities when the story came out that possibly that DC was going to get sold Right, the Warner Brothers or AT and T. Oh, the, one the, the one we did with Larry Young, yeah, yeah. Right, Larry, we were Larry's, a, Larry's a really smart guy too. We were basically saying and suggesting that there was absolutely no way that could happen because there's no money in it. There's no way to make money to do that, right? And to, <clears throat> and so, but I thought the one thing that that, and I don't know. But the one thing that occurred to me when 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 I heard about this, it, I didn't think that anybody was going to go in and license DC and take it over and publish, you know, as a licensing product. What I thought might happen is that AT and T or whoever would go to say, Boom or IDW or somebody and say, We do not want the expense or the hassle of publishing comics. You guys do it, and we all, you know, they have final word and everything like a license deal, but could you see them just giving it to somebody else to do and then taking X amount of, you know, give them kind of like what Image did with you guys. You guys do all this work and we'll give you 20% and we're taking 80% or whatever, rather than trying to cut a deal where someone actually licensed the books from them because that couldn't happen. But can you see a scenario where at and is like, we don't want this hassle. You know, we want to keep the IPs. You guys, so they would have actually zero overhead, and all they would do is collect whatever amount of the profits were if 
IDW or somebody else basically manage their line for them. Is that a workable scenario? No, I, that's even less workable than, than the Why others. do you say that? Um, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand how you're structuring the deal from the point. Well, according to but, some according to some authorities, and I, I don't know who I'm quoting rumor at this point, but the way I understand it, and it, certainly Malibu would have done this if we'd have been alive, uh, we would have gotten in touch with DC a long time ago and pitched them on the idea of doing just that, taking over the line or, or, you know, taking the responsibility and the expense of creating comics off of, off the Warner Brothers balance sheet in exchange for whatever. Right. right? And the reason that hasn't happened, according to the people who reported it to begin with, is that. AT&T, Warner Brothers, whoever, wanted way too much money for the privilege. Well, okay, but but, but then in saying that, with, what they're really saying is they don't really want to get rid of it, right? Because if they wanted to get rid of it, they'd find a way to let, for them to be completely advantageous. See, what you're talking about still sounds to me like a licensing deal where they're going to somebody and saying, we want you guys to take this over, but you got to pay us X amount of dollars up front and guarantee us X amount of money and blah, 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 right? Whereas well, just that, saying- that's, that's the only thing Warner Brothers would be willing to do. It's, but it's I, kind, I, it's okay. kind of the point because that's, that's, their, that's their mentality. They think they own a Lamborghini and from, um, from the po comics publishing perspective, you know, they basically own a Toyota. Well, that's the point. They've got to know what the balance sheet is, though, right? I mean, don't they? They have to know that they're. it's costing them, let's say, I don't know what the numbers are. You might even know the numbers. But say it's costing them $20 million a year to, op $20 million a year to operate this, and they're generating $50 million a year or $40 million a year profit or, or uh, overall. So you're only maybe making 20 or $30 million profit on the comic books where they could suddenly go, you know what, we could make 50 million and not have any overhead. If we, you know, let someone else take this over, not take control because they would still like a licensing agreement, they'd still have to approve everything, right? I mean, that would, that's the pain in the butt for the publisher that takes it over, is right? They don't have free reign to do whatever they want. They're still gonna be at the, the whim of the owner of the, the, the IP, which is AT&T or Warner Brothers or whoever. Um, but it seems to me that would be a way for them to, you know, drop just to get drop any debt and get all pure profit out of it. Because um, surely they must know that what they have is not really worth that much. So I guess by, by I think it's that I think it's that last assumption that you're making that's the fallacy. Okay. But if they're keeping all if if you're just looking at the the profits from comics, right? Not toys, games, movies. They're keeping all that. <clears throat> They're just saying, we understand that these books need to stay in print simply for the, you know, to keep these ideas alive, right? Let's say, so we can continue to mine them for uh, TV and movies and whatever else. But they must be, they look at the balance sheet and say, well, just in terms of comic properties, these things were worthless. You know, I mean, they can't imagine if, if you if you separate the and maybe they're not smart enough to do this. You know, that may be very. But. they they have to be able to see that the publishing, if the publishing branch was making them a lot of money, they wouldn't be even interested in getting rid of it and they wouldn't be interested in cutting back on it. They'd be expanding so they could make more money, but they must see that it's a dead end. Right. Well, I've always it's always hard to figure out exactly how they parse these things because right. Bat, Batman is a bunch of different things, right? Right. It's, it's comic books and it's potential movies and it's cartoons and it's God only knows how many different million kinds of licensed products, right? So they're, you're saying there's basically no way that as a business they can look at this in any other way than licensing it out as a comic book property yeah 
And I, I guess I can see that from a business standpoint that it's like you're to let someone take over your publishing and not give them anything except profits from the comics. They can't separate the idea that Batman comic book is, you know, it's yeah. I mean, to them, that would just be another licensing agreement. That's the only way they can look at it. Yeah, I, I don't. And I, well, and I think the big problem is um, I think the fans imagine that DC would stay intact. And I think the more likely scenario is um, did not exactly this, but something like this, where, you know, Batman um, would go to IDW and Superman would go to Boom. And, right. you know, Flash and Green Lantern and Wonder Woman would go to Oni or whatever. Right. Um, or or you, if you don't divide it up by character, you divide it up by product category. So you'd have characters that you might have, you know, boom, getting one style of comic and um, IDW getting a different style of comic. Like right. what Marvel did with IDW for those kiddie versions of the super, of those Star Wars books. Right. But that wasn't a licensing deal, was it? I mean, wasn't sure, that? The of course, yeah, of course it was. Okay. Okay. But it's interesting because now um, I don't know exactly what the details of the arrangement are, but basically um, Boom went to Disney as part of the Fox deal. Are you telling me that Boom is owned by Disney? Well, kind of, yeah. Because I didn't, I didn't. What deal did they have with Fox that made them part of Fox's uh, portfolio? I, I, say. I have to ask somebody that's smarter than me. Interesting. I had no idea because it, it was because you know Ross just recently. I mean, by Ross, I mean Ross Ritchie, the uh, publisher there, and and basically the, the, founder. You the, the. You mean the former publisher? Well, see, I didn't know that, but I saw that he got got promoted to president of board of directors or whatever, and I'm like, wait a minute, dude, isn't it your company? Why don't you just make yourself, you know, president of the board of directors or whatever? Well, he, yeah, but he's been like, selling off pieces and getting money, investment money from all sorts of Hollywood people for a long time. Okay, so basically that, and there was a, there was a big investment. Um, by Fox at one point, that's how he ended up getting Buffy and Firefly away from Dark Horse. Oh, interesting. See, I didn't, I didn't really, I'm not really paying attention to this stuff, at least from that business standpoint. I had no idea that was going on. Um, so really he's, even though it's his company that he founded, he's, you know, as vulnerable as anybody else that's now owned by a bigger conglomerate. Well, yeah. Well, hopefully he's taking care of himself and and, right. made the, and 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 made the right protection deals for himself. But yeah. Right. So really, yeah, what it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty typical shell game in Hollywood for sure. Yeah. So once again, what we're saying is there's no way to make long term money in comics. <laughs> If you, want, if you want to make a million dollars in comics, start off with two million. <laughs> That's that may be the greatest line of all time. I love that. If you want to make a million dollars in comics, start off with two million. Yep. Oh my gosh. And yet we keep trying, Dave, because we love it so much. It's such a wonderful medium. Well, it it it's it it. it you know, infested our, our our imagination as children, and we haven't been able to shake it. Yeah, and we're but not, just, the, and we're not the only fan base that has the same problem. You know, pro wrestling fans have the same problem. NASCAR fans have the same problem. A lot of sports fans have the same problem. Yeah, I mean, fan fandom fans are fans. You know, and it generally the, the, a lot of it just depends on what sort of and gets into your 13-year-old brain and won't let go. 
Yeah, and that's it, it, it's it's an interesting thing on how this is all sort of because there was a time, and even back, you know, in the sixties and seventies, maybe there was a time in the sixties, and of course during the golden age during the war, comics were very profitable. But and you had a period of time, probably in the sixties, where they were pretty profitable. But it's like I talked about, you know, with Simonson earlier today, and I read this in that uh, that Marvel book, uh, the Marvel Comics Untold Story or whatever. I don't know if you've read that book. Uh, yeah, I've read a couple of those Marvel, those Marvel they books. They were all basically books. sitting around in the mid seventies, going, you know, by nineteen eighty, this industry is going to be dead, you know, because sales were dropping. So they were basically being experimental and doing stuff and uh, well, doing I, some I, I told I told you my Marv Wolfman story, right? I mean uh, Marv and I my, Marv and I laugh about it to this day. I went to I went to work to went to work I went to Chicago <clears throat> the Chicago convention at the Playboy Towers in nineteen seventy six. Stan Lee was there. I got him to autograph something I don't have anymore. But I sought out two writers that I read a lot of their stuff, Don McGregor who couldn't have been nicer to me. Um, yeah. And I was a, just a 16-year-old punk kid, right? But my goal was to figure out if I wanted to occur in comics, I wanted to find out from the pros what I should do about that now that I'm 16. Like, colleges should I should go to, courses of study I should take, you know, what? what's the, what's the next step if, the, if, the, if I'm really, truly serious about it? Right. And at that point, I was reading Marv's Tomb of Dracula, which is just an astonishingly great piece of work. He and Gene Colan created this thing that elevated itself well above a vampire book, I think. Right. Um, but I cornered Marv and I said, you know, it's 1976. Um, what should I, and I'm 16, I'll be going to college soon. What course of study should I take? What should I do if I want a career in comics? And he looked me right in the eye and he said, do anything else. <laughs> this, this, this industry is dying, and everybody, everybody that I know is looking for a way to get out. Oh my goodness! So that was 1976, long before Nor you know Marv created Vigilante or Teen Titans or any of the really a lot of the really great things Marv's known for. Well, so do we think? Do you think I should say? Because I don't know, but. Is this just another period of time where we're going, ah, this industry's dying and somehow, some way, it'll survive and just keep on going? Because it seems to do it. I mean, it was going to die in the 90s. Remember when Marvel was going to get broken up and, and sold for pieces and then suddenly rebound, success, you know, back in business? Yeah, maybe. Maybe maybe there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel, but I, I certainly can't see it. and. You and I go searching for it every periodically, and we can't find it. <laughs> um, well, it, 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 see, it, see, it seems to me the only salvation is is some sort of coordination with video, but with the audience so fractured and the volume of material being produced uh, and the size of the fan base, I just don't see how any of that comes together. Because for every profitable book, there's probably 10 unprofitable books. Well, and that's really, I think, I think the, the unsolvable problem is that we as creators have actually started making a living doing this. Whereas before, you could not have made a living in comics drawing a book a month. You had to be doing two or three books a month, right? Just to get a, a decent page rate. I'm talking about before our time, right? In the 60s or whatever. And even maybe into the 70s, it was very difficult to make a decent living without turning out a bunch of work. Yeah, well, and and I'm going to say now, so, I'm going to side and sound something that makes me sound even like a bigger Philistine. Yes. But if you look at the books, like everybody holds up um, Japan as a um, pinnacle of how the society, you know, adopts comics and everybody reads comics. And they read comics about business books and this and that and the other thing. Well, right. the other thing 
to me, when you look at the what's produced in the United States and Canada and, um, and then you or in Europe, and then you look at the stuff that's produced in Japan, it's clear to me that the vast majority of stuff that's produced in Japan is produced at a much faster rate. I'm not saying the guys are less talented. I'm just saying that there are fewer lines on the page. There's less detail. There's less of a lot of things. So they are producing a higher volume of work in order for them to get compensated the way they want. Right. I think every I think every artist would rather have would would rather produce less work that they were able to spend more time on for more money. Right. And that's, it not, and that's not happening in the vast majority of uh, manga that I've seen. I think, no, the, right. I think the stories are compelling, but the art is not generally as detailed or as, um, and, and, and generally it's not colored either on top of everything else. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, I mean, yeah, the artwork, the artwork is being produced at a much faster rate. You're comparing, it's, it's, when you compare manga to American comics, you're comparing apples to oranges. It's not even the same thing. Right. Um, but I'm just trying to compare the pace at which you can you can complete story pages, the pace at which an artist can complete a page that drives the narrative at the same, you know, pace. And I think that stuff just moves. I, I, I think a manga just has more more pages per hour than American comics. Is yes, that, you, you think that's fair? I think it's fair, but I think it's fair. Well, American artists, we've sort of tried to turn comics into fine art instead of the commercial art, right? And there well, isn't some, some of that. Some of that's on the audience too, but part of it, part of it has to do oh. with, with the fact that they used to be able to work at that pace because the dollars that were being generated from those pages were higher. Well, we kept the same level of artistic time consuming artwork but yep. sales continue to fall so that's going to cause a pinch in the system yeah but don't you think that part of the reason and, and maybe it isn't but as part of the reason is if you had i mean if you adjusted for inflation right i think someone looked at this once and said okay in 1970 i mean it's easy you can go to an inflation calculator and figure this out pretty quickly but if you yeah. go to 1975 right and comics were 25 cents, right? So what would a comic book cost today with inflation if it was, you know, for the 75 cents or the 25 cents? It would be about like 250 or something, right? And we've got comic books that are $6. Yeah. And why is that? That's because the talent costs so much. I mean, well, that's the it, That's not the only reason. Well, it's a big reason, though. Um, I would argue that the falling numbers are as big a factor as the cost of the talent. Well, that's true. If you were selling 300,000 copies, it wouldn't make a difference. What? Um, right. If you're selling that many copies, you could sell them a lot cheaper and still make, you'd still make your money. Yeah, that, that's my so point. Is the reality then that what we're looking at is that Let's just face it. There's too much competition out there where there wasn't in the 70s. Who was that? Sorry. That's for us. Oh, hey, Brian. Um, so, so is that what we're saying then is basically that there's... Dear Lord, dog. Hush. Pizza. Uh, oh, thank Comic you. Comic-Con pizza. $15 oh. a slice. <laughs> Should I eat it? Yeah, I'll eat it. Shelly's brother-in-law dropped by and the dog's going nuts. Uh, dropped by to gave me some pizza. How about that? My con pizza. Yeah. Look at that. Mm. that Dave looks, is starving in his hotel room. I hate to say it. That kind of looks like con pizza. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> mm. Con pizza. Mm. Yeah. What's well, that, Brian? Wrath of con pizza or comic con pizza? Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. wait. Aaron, remind Brian what this is. Aaron. Oh, I'm sorry. Dave, in case you didn't know, too. You're a part of what I like to call Aaron. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> oh, no, I'm 
nothing but the finest entertainment here, Dave. Uh, I'm well aware. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is what happens when you like do stuff out of your home, right? The professionalism goes right out the window, baby. Not on Geek View Tavern. Geek View Tavern is nothing but super professional. So I don't know what you're talking about. That's right. So you're going to steal all my uh, my viewership so they can go. Uh, no, because I'm only up like twice a month and you're up every damn day. Oh, well, yeah, I got to make a living, right? I haven't uh, made it. Not doing this, but. Uh... <laughs> oh, Boy, I like your hair. I cut my hair short like that. Oh, thank you. Who's this guy? Uh, this is uh, Captain Marvel, the new well, Captain. I'm glad, I'm glad yeah. you fixed the crotch on that, though. That was embarrassing. I don't even know what that. I told you to. You know, you're like my daughter. She comes up and she's like, <laughs> "That doesn't look right." I'm like, oh, I'm like laying the. A, a critic. Critic. I'm laying the page out, and she's like, "That doesn't look right." I'm like, "Wait till it's done." And the page like, "Try the crotch." I don't get it. What's going on there? I'm not even finished with it. Gee, many Christmas. Let's, uh, let's check some comments. Why What's doesn't she? Ha why doesn't she have a nose? Because I haven't drawn it yet. <laughs> in my, in my mind, I helped you fix that drawing. See, that's that's well, how I think of it. Well, you keep telling yourself that. Hi, yeah. David. So, Wait. so anyway, let me let me come back to oh, sorry conversation camera here for a second because my All brother right. trying to stick his head in here yeah, and get yeah, on the sit here. Really? Yeah. Go ahead. Um. So, so okay, to, to, yeah. to, to finish up, it's my brother-in-law, Brian. Uh, How are you doing? Uh, How are you doing, my friend? Dave Olbitch. Olbitch? <laughs> wow. There's Dave Olbitch. Yeah. Um, wow. Close, close enough for government close word. Enough. Dave Olbitch. I have to get closer? Yeah, see, you can't see. There he is. There he is. Hi. I'm very uncomfortable. I'm Shelly with the beard. Dave was, yeah, that's right. Dave was the publisher of uh, <laughs> Ultraverse Comics. You know, I, I put... <gasps> I put Brian. He was a gang member yes, in one of Spike the Kings. in one of the Elven books mm -hmm. that I oh, did. Nice. Yep. Yeah. So I, I was uh, within uh, one page uh, killed off. Well, I, yeah. I told him it wasn't going to last. So, but I did put him in there. So there you go. And if you remember, Shelley was Ace Reporter Shelley Rogers in uh, Sludge. Uh -huh. I'm well she aware. Very many issues. So. Yep. Anyway. So, okay, so my question was to kind of round this conversation out was, so basically what we're looking you know, at. You know, no one's watching anymore, right? No, they are. I, well, okay. Now the eye candy here. That's right. It's gonna, the numbers are going to go up. No, the, see, the thing is when you came on and started talking negative about comics, there goes the there goes the audience. As, as soon as I started banging on Andrew Reb, then everybody laughed. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That was hysterical, Dave. I loved it. So basically, you always know, Dave, you speak your truth. That's I love right. that. So you just think there's really the reality is there's too much competition for the entertainment dollar for comics to be a viable big time option going forward. Yeah, there, there's a lot of impediments, but one of the biggest ones is the bar is too low. Yeah. So basically what you're saying then is, Dave, and I'm putting words in your mouth, but nostalgia is keeping comics alive. Is that what you're saying? Really? I wasn't saying that at all, actually. Oh, yeah. I think that's exactly what you're saying. Now no one's going to go to Geek View Tavern because you've... Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, we do nothing but talk about nostalgia there because... Okay. Know, all right. I'm, 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 you, know, you can't really call it anything but nostalgia when you don't talk about the new comics you're reading and you're only reading one new comic a week or something. Oh, okay. Well... Ah... <sighs> Dave, I'm going to end this because uh, it's 9 o'clock, which means 12 o'clock Eastern time. And I've been doing this since noon. Oh, my Lord. Uh, today. And um, I think that's the judicious thing to do. I think you're right. But I want to thank you. And well, I mean, thank you. No, no. Thank you for coming in as a last minute guest to kind of fill out the programming for today. I was trying to get Terry in, but, you know, Terry's yeah. a busy guy. You're yeah. not a busy guy. You'll call me from a hotel room. Yeah. and. I can always count on you, Dave, to give us we uh, love you, Dave regale us with stories of <laughs> yesteryear and Ultraverse and everything else. So, yeah, yeah, I'm just an old guy that's got a bunch of shitty opinions. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that's but why we, we, we love, love you. you. Anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't have too many illusions, but I am the only employee at Jackrabbit Technologies that's got his own Wikipedia page. So, there you go. Yeah. There you go. That means something. I haven't even got one of them. Because no. I am nobody. Shelly with a beard is here for the ladies. 
Yeah. <laughs> Booyah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Booyah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What's this? Oh, okay. There you go. Kelly with a beard is here for the ladies. That's uh, Brian. Yeah, I got rid of mine. I got rid of mine this morning. I, I, so. I, all right, all right, ladies that are still watching this, sound off because yeah, yeah, really, the, the silence is going to be deafening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do have one. Uh, she calls herself a Lady Celtic Moon. Oh, okay, shows cool. So, but I um, names. and I do have a couple every once in a while that show up, but it's not a it's not a wide variety of. Uh, Female viewership. Yeah. Although I made some in Facebook, you know, my uh, cousins come in every once in a while and uh, watch, and that's why I have to control. And I have to watch because I'm here. I have to control your language, Dave. That's why because we have you know little mm. kids that are watching this because they want to draw off the me. I have a potty mouth. I've got a kid with a potty mouth. It's, it's I, and you just blow up the internet. Yeah, it's awful. It's awful. Here's a couple things that I don't know that I agree with, but here's one right here. Dave is a star, a star. from Hyper Potato. Right. I, I, I don't, yeah, I, that's got to be sarcasm, right? Well, no, this is, I think he's trying to be truthful, and you can't come on my show and basically compliment a guest and diss me in the same breath. <laughs> that's what yeah. Hyper Potato gets for. There you uh, go. You come with Aaron as a star, and we're glad that Dave was able to bask in his his uh, glory. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm looking for. You need to be uh, able. To, you need to grow some more hair before you. I know. That's where I lost. Friend. That's where I lost my fandom. Is when the yeah. hair went. When yeah. I was a teen idol. You had beautiful. You had, be- you had beautiful locks. I have pictures. Michelle. Sean Cassidy. That's right. Me, Sean Cassidy. It was. It was. Bay we City were, Rollers. Exactly. <laughs> I, I had those. I had those checkered pants with the with the cuffs. The rite of passage. <laughs> yep. Damn right well, I did. Baby. Saturday night. Oh. That's right. Uh, oh now wait a minute. Look I at this. this. My wife is often listening and watching. She enjoys Shelly more than the comics. <laughs> They are nine millimeter sisters. <laughs> yep. We're packing heat, sister. Oh, oh, so funny. oh my goodness. Now nah, Jeff Potts. No, no, no thank, no, no, thank you. you. And I think uh, that's see, it's, it's, it's yeah. really is. that's the way the game's played. Get that guy to do it like everything. All right. Here's your last question before I kick you out of here. As a pro wrestling fan, Dave, how is AEW really doing? Well, I mean Right now, they're overperforming based on their booking and their talent. So, we'll see. They well, they have not. they they have they have a lot of potential there, but they're you know they're trying to to compete with McMahon. And that's hard. So, well, he is. There's, there's some of it that I like, and some of it that I don't like, and some of it's I I, I admire their willingness to try stuff. Um, but you know, I I think. Right now, for me, the show's about 50-50. When it's good, it's really, really good. But when it's bad, it's awful. So, well, there you go. There you go. There's your there's your honest opinion by Dave. Once again, casting negativity on more of the fan base. <laughs> they, need, they, they, need, they, need, they need one fewer voice in the announcer's booth. That's for sure. That's right. I'm gonna yeah. Next time I have you on, I'm going to go, if you want to cry... Dave Olbrich tonight on, you know, Aaron Live. And um, <laughs> you'll send him home in tears, Dave. No, I, and I'm the nice one. You should, I mean, you should, you should talk. Literally, you should, we, should, we got to find a way to get Tom to come on. My my cohort at the the permanent bar fly at Geek View Tavern. We got to get I him to come I on. I don't know if I can handle both you guys. Every time well, we oh, do. Oh, no, 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 no. It should just be you. It just be you and Tom. I'll, I'll watch silently okay. and kibitz from the, from the comment section. Okay. All right. I got to share this because I did finish it. What happened to her hair? Oh, my gosh. Get off the air, Dave. Why did I even invite you on? <laughs> I like your hair. Some people put a comb through their hair when they leave the house. Uh, guess I'm not, I'm not that guy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just being a turd. I know you are. I know you, Dave. I know you are. <laughs> All right. So well, my well, my daughter used to get dressed up to go out. She'd come and ask me how she looked, and I'd tell her, "I go, you're not going to go out like that, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> that always goes well, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then I wonder why she's got a complex, poor girl. Oh, I tell you. 
<laughs> All right, I'm kicking you out of here so I can end this show, Dave. So yeah, I want to say I got, thank I got, you. I, yeah, I got nerdy. Look at him. I gotta go anyway. <laughs> I'm an old man in St. Louis. What do you want from me? <laughs> Dave, honestly, thank you for coming in last minute and sharing a couple hours of stories with everybody. You know, I, you, you know how much I love this stuff, but yeah. every, everybody who's still watching us, and I don't know who you could possibly be, but go check out Geek View Tavern. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave. Thank you. We'll see, talk to you soon. All right. Thank bye, dude. Take care. Bye, Dave. Love you. I love you, too. See ya. All right. That was uh, tremendous. Tremendous. Okay, so technically we've been on, except for my hour break, we've been on since noon today. Started off with the Simonsons, which you can't do better than that. Ended with Dave Ulbrich. You can't do worse than that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So it's been... I thought the creator Richie uh, Richie Rich was going to be here. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> <He can't>... huh? <laughs> Richie Rich. Those I mean, at least favorite. Archie. Ladies and gentlemen, my new sidekick. Oh. Brian Rogers. Thank you so much. Oh, I Thank you. Wonder. It's a it runs train. in the family. It uh -huh. does. So do you, guys, right. do you guys do drawings and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> or is this all tracing? <laughs> I was really good at tracing. Oh, my gosh. Uh. All right. Okay. So I got to spend a little time with the fam. So I'm, I'm heading out of here. Hot. It's 9 o'clock. It's midnight on the East Coast. Let's call it a night. So I've it's done, I drew Captain night. Marvel. I drew, who else did I draw? Zatanna. Zatanna. So it was a pretty good day, really. And we had multiple guests Whoa. and even people we weren't expecting showed up. And so I think we've all had a really good time yep. tonight. But it's not over. It's going to be back tomorrow at 2 p.m. <laughs> and David Williams is going to join us around 5. So we'll try and get some sketches in and some art in before Dave yep. shows up. And really blows the show up and we go off on a big big bang really mm -hmm. so anyway you guys thank you again in all sincerity thanks for joining me and staying a lot of you guys stayed with me all freaking day and i can't, I can't believe, believe it. it and i appreciate it uh but do come back tomorrow david williams he's going to be here and he's going to be drawing so there's going to be art That's flowing cool. yeah. so it'll be very cool and it'll be the final day of aaron con oh i can't believe you did it i know Would it's going to be it's going to be the final day of uh, aaron <laughs> And uh, so you don't want to miss day three because anything could happen, and it probably piece? will. Is that hairpiece is wearing? <laughs> I think so. Actually, it was a Star Trek too, but it was good. It was really it was a nice looking yeah, hairpiece. Yeah, so anyway, uh, five p.m. Eastern, two p.m. Pacific. That is correct. Every time I a time comes out of my mouth, it's Pacific time. So adjust accordingly. But um, I will again post a little thing in Facebook and on Twitter and everywhere tomorrow morning, so you know what time to to jump in and join me as we try and get rid of the rest of my inventory and uh, finish up on my sketch request. So anyway, thank you guys. Shelly. Appreciate it. Shelly needs some shoes. There's, there's <laughs> Shelly, there's Brian, here's me, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>